Whenever you're ready, Madam Clerk, we are going to get hopping here. Okay. The hour of 1230 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will be in session. Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Councilmember Brunner is currently absent. Um, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder is absent, and Mayor Keeley. Here. Uh, I'm designating Councilmember Shepard Kalantari Johnson as our uh, Vice Mayor Pro Tem for today in the absence of our regular Vice Mayor. Statements of disqualification. We have any statements of disqualification by members? Seeing here none, we'll move on. Uh, this would be the opportunity for anyone who's with us today or online to comment on our regular closed session. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, we will be uh, leaving this, we will adjourn this session, we will come back later after our closed session. We go into closed session to discuss matters of personnel, pending litigation, or potential future litigation. We have some items on this under item number one are listed on our city council agenda. Anyone in chambers wish to make comments on the closed session agenda? Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? With Nobody their online. Hand raised? No one with their hand raised. Very good. Now, for those of you who are online, um, what we are... Nobody online. Excuse me. Nobody's online. Okay, good. Then I don't have to uh, issue that admonishment. All righty. Uh, okay, at this point, we will adjourn this meeting of the City Council in order to go into closed session. We will be back out here in open session to take up items two through the end of our agenda when we finish that. I suspect we will be here back in session. We won't be here before 1.30. It could be after that, but it won't be before 1.30. We'll stand adjourned into closed session. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session and the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Terry Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder is absent and Mayor Keeley? Here. Uh, we are going to now hold the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority. Uh, I will call that meeting to order, and the clerk will call the roll. Directors Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Terry Johnson? Present. Vice Chair Golder is absent, and Chair Keeley? Here. A quorum being present, we will have the election of officers. Ms. Bush, will you step us through that? Um, similar to election, we just need a motion and a second to elect the officers as seen on the agenda report. The officers, as recommended on the agenda report, our executive director would be Matt Huffaker, the treasurer would be the finance director, Ms. Cabell, the chair would be myself, the vice chair would be our vice mayor, and the secretary would be Ms. Bush. Is there a motion to that? I'll move. There's a motion. I'll second. Second by Ms. Bruner, debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none. Anyone wish to present on this item, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Can I just, who was the first on the, the maker? That was me. Thank you. Ms. Contar Johnson, second by Ms. Bruner. Director Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Calantari Johnson. Aye. And Chair Keeley. Aye. We adjourn that meeting. We are now on item three, the minutes of the, excuse me, we are still in that session. Uh, we have uh, item three, the adoption of minutes of the October 2023 meeting of the Industrial Development Authority. The, meeting, the uh, minutes are in the packet. Ms. Brown moves adoption. Uh, there is a second uh, oh, under discussion uh, just, uh, by uh, Ms. Watkins, opportunity for public comment on this item. Seeing and hearing none, motion and a second, the clerk will call the roll. 
Director Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Present. Aye. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Helen Perry Johnson. Aye. Uh, and Chair Keeley. Aye. Uh, staying in that capacity, we have uh, the minutes of the meeting of October 10, 2023. Mr. Newsom moves adoption. Ms. Bruner seconds. Debate or discussion. Those with us wish to comment, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Just to confirm, we've already done the motion for the minutes. We just did that. Very good. Yeah. Annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. Clerk will call the roll. Um, Director Newsom. Roll call. Thank Present. Thank you. Um, Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Calentari Johnson? Present. Vice President Golder is absent and President Keeley? Will you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an awfully nice ring to it. Uh, here. Um, we, uh, we are on the item of election of officers and uh, the recommended officers are Chief Executive Officer Mr. Huffaker, Chief Financial Officer Ms. Gabel, President myself, Vice President, Vice Mayor Golder, and Secretary Treasurer, Ms. Bush. Is there a motion in that regard? So moved. Motion by Ms. Watkins, second by Mr. Newsom. Debate or discussion on the item? Anyone with us wish to make comments on the item? Seeing hearing none, clerks will call the roll. Director Newsom. Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice President Golder is absent, and President Keeley? Mm. Uh, uh, aye. On uh, item five, this is the minutes of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Finance Corporation of October 10th, 2023. Those are in our packet. There is a motion by Ms. Brown, second by Ms. Kalantari Johnson, to approve as submitted public comment. Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Director Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent, and Mayor Keeley, uh, sorry, President Keeley. Here, and uh, aye. Uh, the uh, motion to adjourn that body is in order. Ms. Contar Johnson moves. Uh, Ms. Watkins seconds adjournment. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. The body is adjourned. We're back in session as the Santa Cruz City Council, and the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom. Present. Brown. Here. Watkins. Here. Bruner. Present. Helen Terry Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder is absent and Mayor Keeley. Present. We have a quorum. This will be the opportunity under oral communication for anyone to address us on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda for a period of time not to exceed two minutes. Anyone with us wish to make such comments? Anyone online, Ms. Bush, with their hand up? Yes. We'll take that person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Yes, hello. Um, this is Garrett. Hey, perhaps before some of you walk out or bury your head in notebooks, note the real point of whatever follows here in this minute amount of public speaking time is I believe the city would apply for any grant, raise any tax, raise any fee for any purpose to do the bidding of any moneyed interest, no matter the local public's will, use the public's own money to engage against them in costly and insidious mass persuasion efforts to gaslight them against their opinion, to persuade them. If they objected to your plans. The city refuses to take a public no for any answer. Recall Measure M. Recall the defeated first half cent sales tax increase Measure F, but you just brought it back again as soon as possible using more of the people's own money, even paying expensive survey and mass persuasion consultants to generate more effective language to persuade voting for the identical Measure L. You also seem to misuse and disguise your measures as grassroots campaigns, such as the abysmally rejected affordable housing fraudulently named People's Affordable Housing Initiative, or this recent Measure Z, which was never a grassroots effort, but it deceptively says so in the government seated campaign literature. My core observation after the erosion events of 2023 was that at first the city tried to ramrod the unpopular give up climate changing grift driven managed retreat approach to make Westcliff one way with homes expendable, tried to avoid any costly obligations to repair or install known effective coastal city cliff protections, but enough people said nope fix it and put it back the way it was, keep it two-way, and just stuff your desire to eliminate cars. But did that stop you? No. 
Uh, plan B emerged, uh, spending expensive public bucks again on slick mass persuasion consultants to divine a never-before-needed 50-year vision, also now a never-before-needed five-year plan for Westcliff, the real goal of which is to affect its, its all-year, air quote, the public's idea to cement, surprise, surprise, the original city's vision to make a Westcliff one way and choose cheaper, less effective coastal protection methods, no matter what the micro-locals that oppose that wanted. The city's air quote vision is really about getting grants, the big state outside interest money, to do their bidding, not ours, while making this city making this city government ever bigger, more expensive, and committed to ever more expense as quizlings of this state. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else on oral communication? Welcome. I'm Mr. Golder. I've been here since 78. And I just want to mention, uh, Remind the city about a survey that was done back in 2006 for the general plan um, um, uh, by an independent firm. The question was, how do you feel about building sports fields, playgrounds, and other park amenities in the Greenbelt? Okay. This was question 53 in that survey. Results, 62% favor, 28% strongly. Uh, um, and then... Uh, 32% uh, opposed, and by age group from 18 to 29, 77% favored it strongly, uh, 38, 30 to 44, 59% favored, and 45 plus 57% favored it. Why is it that this city has only built one new ball field in 60 years? 60 years. That's Depot Park, and they screwed that one up, and it cost them, uh, uh, um, I think, about $2.4 million to fix it up, and it was closed for a couple of years, practically. And, uh, and now it needs a, new, uh, it needs a new, new green plastic lawn. So you'll be hearing more on that. Uh, Tony, uh, uh, Tony Elliott knows a great deal of the research I've done. I spent many years working on this stuff and uh, trying to get uh, the opportunities for people to, to have ball fields. We've got uh, 2,000 acres there where we're not using very well. And we're supposed to be activating it. So, um, and I, have I got any more time? <laughs> 14 seconds. Okay, well, the other thing is the, uh, the San Lorenzo Park, and you got a $2.5 million loan, and I've been looking at the, uh, uh, this whole thing about the city having this no building ordinance. <laughs> needs to be addressed. It's against the uh, uh, Section 10, Article 4 of the, uh, uh, the California Constitution, uh, Access to Navigable Waters. Tony uh, Condotti knows I've given him the hard decisions on that. So we've got some opportunities to fix some things here. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Thank you for your work over the years and looking into that. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. My name is Steve Bowser. I live in uh, uh, Pacific Avenue North. Uh, I want to start by thanking the council for having this oral communication session. It helps uh, the public's voice to be heard. Uh, I also want to, before I give my presentation, ask permission to give one on behalf of my daughter who's busy at work and could not get away. And that would be later. That would be later after other people have had a chance to speak. If that's all right. I'm not clear on the request. Just just say it one more time. My, uh, my daughter also wanted to give a presentation, but she couldn't because she couldn't get away from her work. And I'm asking permission to give it on her behalf uh, after other people have had a chance. I think what I'm going to say on that is no, not because I don't want to hear from your daughter, but because folks do need to make those presentations themselves. So please proceed. I won't count any of this against your time. You were asking me a question. So let's start the clock over for the gentleman, and we'll start hearing your comments. Thank you, sir. Okay. On the basis of the documents that I've distributed to all members of the council and available to all members who are here, uh, uh, if you haven't had one, you just ask me after I talk. Um, uh, what I want, what I want to do, is speak on the behalf of a group of, of citizens who are disturbed by the the current uh, election system, which uh, 
uh, does not give as many people a possibility of being represented in the city council as would seem to be required by the California Voting Rights Act. Uh, in the past, uh, the, for many decades, the council has been elected by a traditional method called uh, uh, plurality uh, voting. And that, quite normally, as it works out, uh, that about 50% of the votes are counted for winning candidates, and about 15, 50% are not counted for winning candidates. And so you have about half of, the po half of the voting population not necessarily being happy with being represented. Uh, now, that, that, that seems to be wrong from a, both a moral and a legal point of view, from, from our group's point of view. The moral point of view starts, I think, with our, we're all Americans. We know that the Declaration of Independence said all people are created equal. And what ha the, the past uh, electoral system that uh, we are using enables a mere majority of voters, either intentionally or not, to exclude all minority voters from being represented at all. So the minority people are not being treated equal. Of course, if there was no way of voting other than the way we do, then you know, it would just be tough. You know? But there are other ways. There, is it, have it finished? That's your two minutes when we reset the clock. So I'm going to give you 15 more seconds. You've got to get right to your point. OK. Uh, th this, this problem would be uh, largely remedied if Santa Cruz chose to use the system that he uses in Albany in the, California, in the San Francisco area, which would guarantee almost 90% of all citizens would see a member of the uh, council that they had preferred. Thank you very much. Proportional we appreciate, rank your, choice we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Ms. Bush, while the gentlelady is approaching, do we have anyone online with their hand up? No. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Nancy Crusoe. Uh, let me see if I can. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Okay. I thought I had three minutes. I'm going to read very fast. So to make it two, very fast. One person, one vote, every vote counts equally. We believe those slogans because that's the basis of our elections and of our democracy. The purpose is to create an equitable distribution of political power, and that matters to me. But the truth is, even though all votes are counted, not all are equally effective, because half of them are not represented by the winners. Winners In Santa Cruz, 41% have not counted. They were wasted in our two district elections. That means 59% of all votes cast elected the winning candidates. Now we have a choice to make, to come very close to our desired goal of each vote carrying the same weight and effectiveness. We need proportional ranked choice voting, which guarantees almost 90% of voters' ballots are represented on the council. We also had this choice four years ago when the city was challenged to provide equal opportunity for protected classes. But the council knew then that switching would guarantee a vastly larger percentage of voters would be represented, but instead of investigating that choice with the public, Cindy Attorney Tony Condotti led the council to switch to plurality district elections. Districts were presented as the only choice. Most of us were not aware of the choice we had since we were kept almost entirely in the dark about this important matter. Many of us felt cheated and deceived by the city by its failure to publicly announce and fully disclose the critical choice we had, especially when we learned some of the benefits of ranked choice voting. Uh, 15, let's cut. Voter turnout increases. It saves time and money, avoids the spoiler effect of vote splitting. Reduces Thank you very much. We That's appreciate it. you being here. Thank you. Please Next put person. this on the agenda Thank and vote much. for a, uh, an Thank ad hoc committee much. to investigate it immediately. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Next person, you have two minutes, not two and a half minutes, two minutes. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. David Snassi here. I will be mindful of my two minutes. I've taken my time out of work, set my family aside as needed, 
So I want to say as a citizen of the city, I appreciate you all hearing me in this time. I've set aside the time to come here and speak. I appreciate you all listening. I'm here to speak to the need of us to put together a committee to look at proportionate rank choice voting. The reason being our drive as public servants at the end of the day is engagement. We want to represent the understanding, the feelings, the thoughts, the needs of our community. So to keep it simple and on the surface, what we're looking for is engagement. You all know this, in 2022 we had a strike, that was engagement. It carries forward into the 2024 election, that was engagement. I'm not here to be the winner, I'm here to bring the voice forward for our community and what we need is critical levels of engagement. If we look at it on paper right now and see that only 50% of our voters, of which we had 49% turnout, if only 50% of their voices represented, what is that level and feeling of engagement? So we know on our side of organizing, and for y'all on that side of the dais, a big challenge is that public engagement. And what happens when we don't have it is the dissolution of trust in the process. We know, we're intimately involved here, that we're doing the best we can. And so what we've learned is new information that to meet the needs of our public's voice, we have a methodology that gets effective turnout, or rather representation of that turnout, at 90% as opposed to 50%. So please put it on the agenda to form a committee to look at proportional ranked choice voting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Greg Bengson, and I, uh, I live in Santa Cruz, a registered voter in Santa Cruz. Scott Newsom is my district person for here, Justin Cummings for county, but um, um, I've been still living over at the uh, library parking lot with uh, a few people um, just waiting for apartment to come through. In the meantime, uh, I, I guess everybody that's living on the streets currently uh, is in the same predicament of um, we you can't be here and you can't be there, and uh, existentially it just doesn't uh, add up and I understand part of it's just uh, to squeeze us to squeeze us into some uncomfortable levels to seek services to the highest level that that we uh, can and I understand that but some people are just never going to um, seek services other people have everything down they're just waiting and to be put in the impossible predicament and just losing stuff every week um, mostly people stealing it, but sometimes the city workers who are trying to do their job and clean up, they're supposed to clean that parking lot, and, and we hate getting in their way. Um, we just, we, we exist still, and uh, so we do. Um, and the, the cops come and move us along every day, and um, but they're very patient, polite, um, uh, and I'm not just saying that. I saw Chief Escalante's face pop up there for a little bit, so just like I told you a couple weeks ago, uh, Still, still treating us quite well that, on, on the part that I witness. I hear other reports, but just as far as what I see. Uh, I usually like to have some sort of solution, but I don't. I'm just uh, describing the situation as is, and, uh, and we'll try to come up with some solutions. Thank you. Uh, somebody left some cool sunglasses over there. Thank you very much for that. Anyone online, Ms. Bush, with their hand raised? Anybody else under oral communication? We are on item six. This is the mayoral proclamation declaring October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Ms. Contar Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I have the honor of presenting this proclamation today. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to read through parts of this proclamation. So, whereas each October, National Domestic Violence Awareness Month is recognized through educational events, community gatherings, and support groups, and whereas according to the National Institute of Health, nearly one in four women and one in nine men in our country have suffered physical violence by an intimate partner, and whereas domestic violence affects people, affects people of all genders, sexual orientations, ages, racial, ethnic, cultural, social, religious, and economic groups in the United States and here in California. And whereas there is a need to provide education, awareness, and understanding of domestic violence and its causes. And whereas the City of Santa Cruz, the City Council of Santa Cruz took formal action 
on September 8th of 1981 by Ordinance Number 81-29, and the Santa Cruz Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women was established. And whereas 43 years later, the Santa Cruz Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women has been working to end domestic violence, sexual assault, and sexual harassment in the city of Santa Cruz through prevention programs, prevention programs and public policy. And since its formation, the Santa Cruz Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women has made significant contributions to the Santa Cruz community by collaborating with local agencies like Monarch Services and Walnut Avenue Women's Center to support and amplify their prevention programs and community-based strategies to reduce domestic violence and support survivors. Whereas the Santa Cruz Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women has partnered with Santa Cruz City Schools to empower young adults to make informed choices resist peer pressure and build healthy relationship and have actively raised awareness about domestic violence through community events. Therefore, now therefore I, Shebra Kalantari Johnson, on behalf of our mayor and the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2024 as Domestic Violence, Prevention, domestic violence Awareness Month in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage members of our community to participate in activities during the month of October to raise awareness and work together to prevent violence in our world. I ended up reading every word. Um, it, this is a really important issue. I want to thank the members of our CAPVA committee um, who invest your time and resources in doing all the work that you do. And um, yeah, give you a moment to speak, please. Why don't you go present? Right. Just one moment. Just, uh, just please stand up. We, we want to see all you from the commission. Thank you, Mayor uh, Keeley and thank Council. You very much. We thank appreciate you all. we appreciate you, and we're honored to represent the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. We have uh, Commissioners uh, Sherry Gradick and Commission Vice Chair Madura, Commissioner Barrett, Commissioner Novak, and Commissioner Feynman, and I'm Chair Long, and we are honored to accept this. I would also like to mention that in partnership with Monarch Services and the Commission, we will be co-hosting an event on Thursday, October 10th at the old Wrigley Building. Um, to So this will be an art event and it will showcase the artistic talent of youth and adults in our community featuring submissions that express the resilience, strength, and hope of survivors of domestic violence. The art pieces, including featured submissions from survivors in our community, participants in Monarch Services Programming, and students from SoCal High School and Pajaro Valley Unified School District, as well as supportive community members. We Madam hope to see Madam everyone Chair, there. what time is that? That is from 5 to 7 p.m. Thank you. Good. And refreshments will also be served. Thank you all so very, very much for the great work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're on item number seven, Chief. Uh, this is the Fire Prevention Week, October 6th through 14th. Our fire chief is here while you're getting ready. We make sure that you thank every one of your folks for, on behalf of the city council, we deeply appreciate the role you play in public safety in our community. Each and every one of the men and women who work for the department uh, are so dedicated and put their lives on the line for us and help keeping us safe. Will you pass that on to them? Absolutely. Thank and you, uh, again, right back at you. Thank you for all the continued Thank support. You, we appreciate it. Uh, Council, uh, Mayor and Council Members, Rob Bode, Fire Chief, um, here today to talk to you about Fire Prevention Week. But um, just as much as, as important as um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I also want to bring to the attention, it's also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And like many other public agencies, uh, public safety agencies, we, uh, we celebrate or recognize based on wearing pink. And so we are doing it this, this uh, year as well. And so I just wanted to bring it to the attention of, of all of you and the public. We'll be selling these shirts at Fire Admin and at Station One and proceeds go towards uh, cancer research. So I wanted to plug that as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, now I'd just like to talk to you guys a little bit about Fire Prevention Week and what our message for 2024 is. 
Um, like you mentioned, um, this week, we currently are in the middle of it. It's uh, October 6th through the 12th this year. It's typically observed um, this week because of the Great Chicago Fire. But b before I get to that, I will discuss sort of what I want to, I want to talk about the history of Fire Prevention Week, what the theme is, and then even though we did talk in September, it was Emergency Preparedness Month, I would be sort of negligent in my duties and remiss being that we're in October and it's the anniversary of the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake if I did not cover and remind folks to be prepared. So I'll cover a little bit of that as well. Um, again, we are currently in Fire Prevention Week. Uh, it marks the anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire <clears throat> of 1871, which started on the 8th and uh, ended on the 9th. Um, and since then, um, we have publicly observed Fire Prevention Week since 1922. And in 25, President Calvin Coolidge declared it Fire Prevention Week as a national observance. And some people might ask, why is that one so, that fire so significant? Um, the stats themselves are staggering. Um, it was a conflagration fire that killed over 250 people in that 24-hour period. It left 100,000 people homeless, destroyed more than 17,400 structures, and to put it in perspective, it burned over 2,000 acres of land in the city of Chicago. So, um, and I also want to point out that, um, you know, fire prevention and the fire code isn't arbitrarily decided to make things difficult for residents and developers. It is all born out of, unfortunately, tragedy and lessons learned. And so um, that's one of the reasons why Fire Prevention Week is so important. Um, so again, like I've talked about before, we just want to focus on safety awareness. And this event annually is sponsored by the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA. And this year's theme is smoke alarms, make them work for you. Um, these are the posters that we have out um, in English and in Spanish. And again, reminding folks um, to be proactive and be responsible, whether you are a homeowner or a renter. And again, it's on um, the property owner to put these in, but we also just want to make sure that um, everybody has one. And the, the way we want to do that, um, I'll get to in a second, but it's important to note that 60% of fire deaths uh, happen in the homes that don't have smoke alarms and that's basically because at night people are sleeping they are unaware and they have very little time to get out on average you have less than two minutes minutes to escape your home once the fire alarm sounds and so if you don't have one you're literally um you know behind the curve and uh in danger so working smoke alarms give you early warning to get out quickly and that also goes we want to remind people to have an exit plan in their home we always remind them edith exit drills in the home um, every home is different, and we want to make sure that everybody in the home, all ages, are aware of how to, to get out and what their plan is. Um, so with this uh, theme this, this um, year, uh, with the smoke alarms, we want to make sure that people install them. Um, we install them in every bedroom, outside every separate sleeping area, so basically a hallway. On every level of the home, that includes basements, and yes, we do have some, um, some homes in this community that have basements. Um, and we want to test them once a month. I don't know how many people actually test and use that button, but we want to test them. And then with that, we want to replace them. And you replace them for a couple different reasons. Um, nowadays, um, there are lithium ion sealed uh, units, and they're good for 10 years. So usually in the back, you put the date that you install it, and you, you know, the one thing that I do is put a reminder on your phone so that you know when to change that, because 10 years is a long time, but it comes quickly. The other time that you change it is uh, when the alarm no longer responds to that test that you do monthly. Um, and then I think also uh, it's important to remind folks, because it happens all the time, even in my house, if you remove one because of shower steam or cooking smoke, put it back up. <laughs> a lot of times we see it in a lot of actually student housing and others that people take it down because it's an inconvenience. But while it may be an inconvenience temporarily, it is a lifesaver. So we want to remind people to do that. <clears throat> um, and again, just talking about people about where to install, they can go to the nfpa.org website to get more information on types of um, smoke alarms, how to install them, and then, of course, more information on um, the replacement. Uh, next, I just want to quickly go over emergency preparedness. Um, one of the things we talked about last month was um, the four important factors that we need people um, to remember when preparing for emergencies, and that is, first and foremost, have a plan. Um, and make sure that plan is shared with your family and coworkers. As Councilmember Bruner has pointed out, a lot of this can take place um, in the work, 
um, place as well. And so we want to make sure people are prepared in both those locations. Have a kit. I hope that since we did this presentation, some people have heeded the warning and, and prepared some kits. So have those in a car, at work, at home. Stay informed. Um, I, as I was walking over here, I was just informed um, by our um, emergency manager that we are woefully under-registered uh, in terms of the city, in terms of residents signing up for Cruise Aware. So I want to make sure we get the message out that people need to sign up. You can sign up and put the location of both your home and work so that you get the appropriate alerts depending on what the emergency is. So please stay informed. Um, we can see how important that is all over on the southeast with all the storms they're dealing with, that that communication tool is paramount for us to get our early warnings out to the community. And last but not least, get to know your neighbors. I think in this day and age, that's sort of a, a lost art, but um, know who your neighbors are. If someone has disabilities, may need further assistance, it, you know, it goes back to it takes a village. So we want to make sure um, we organize with our neighbors, have a block party, get to know them. And um, again, we can all do better when we work together. Um, ne next, uh, I also want to uh, remind folks that they can go to our, uh, our website under emergency management and they can look up their particular zone. We want to make sure people are familiar with the zone that they live in and work in and that they know the multiple ways out depending on what that emergency or disaster is, fire, earthquake, tsunami, flood. And so the maps that we have have multiple ways that we've identified out. And we also would like people to give us feedback on those as well. So please visit that site. Take a look at where you live and work and make sure you're familiar with that zone. <clears throat> and of course, next, I just want to remind folks that on uh, October 17th at 1017, um, we will be doing participating as a state, as a city, but as a state as a whole in the great California shakeout. Um, you can download the My Shake app and it'll send you an alert at that time to start the drill. We just want to make sure that people are prepared and have a plan. Um, Next, I also want to talk about what people can do in that earthquake. Um, the three things we want people to consider is to shelter in place, unless, of course, buildings unsafe, unstable, or you smell gas. Otherwise, if you go outside, you're doing a couple different things. You're exposing yourself to potentially down power lines, falling glass, building materials, and, of course, we want to keep the roads clear for those first responders that will be coming into your neighborhoods. Uh, next, we want people to look at storage in their homes. Are items stored properly? Could they fall? Can you secure them? Can you move them? And then, of course, do you have a place to take cover if necessary? And again, home and at work. And last but not least, um, consider a tsunami. Um, we've had two in this community in the last decade. And so, again, it's definitely uh, highly likely if we have an earthquake on an offshore fault. So I want people to also go and make sure that they um, know if their home is in a tsunami inundation area and plan accordingly, which would be a move uphill, go upstairs, um, leave the area. Um, they can go to the California Geological Survey website under the Department of Conservation and click on tsunami maps and it'll take you right to your address and you can find out if you are at threat um, or in, in fact in those uh, inundation zones. Um, and again, we're also, as a, a program that we've been working with the state on, going to be installing new signage that people are aware that their neighborhood is in those areas. <clears throat> um, I won't, I won't go through this again. I've talked about having a plan, having to go back. I just really want to implore people to be prepared. And um, again, sign up for Cruise Aware, be part of a FireWise community, or become a CERT uh, member, a Community Emergency Response Team member. Um, they are all um, excellent um, tools that keep us prepared for these disasters. And with that, I'll see if you guys have any questions. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. Oh, Chief, thank you. Thank you for uh, for being here. Let me see. My guess is now that we have district council members, I'm serious about it. Now we have district council members, you know, really focus in on neighborhoods and so on. I suspect that you're going to hear from council members about how they can do something within their district and really focus in on that. I think that's going to be one of the benefits of, of having these districts is people feeling some responsibility more for, for their neighborhood and their area that they represent. So thank you very, very much. Let me give the opportunity to my colleagues to make any comments they may wish to make on this. Yes, Ms. Bruner. Thank you for all those great reminders. And um, I will be having a district open house on December 3rd. And I hope to invite someone from your team um, to have Cruise Aware sign ups and information for District 2. Um, and um, 
I'm wondering if the city will do a drill on that day with the app, like citywide. I know that uh, Safety Officer Dana Stahl has sent this out for the city to participate um, citywide. Um, and so I know there's more details in that, but uh, we'll definitely make sure that, again, city staff and that the community is prepared and aware of that opportunity. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, well, thank you very, very much. Oh, Ms. Brown, excuse me, please. A quick quick uh, comment and a, a question. Um, I, so I was elected as an at-large uh, council member, and so it's hard for me to get outside of that mindset. Um, the question, um, although I do have, I, I'd, I'd love to do something similar. I, I hope our next District 5 uh, council member does, uh, because the pogo nip is in, in the district. Um, but my, so my question is, you know, this is, it's just so great to have this presentation, to, you know, have opportunities to get this on the minds of our residents. And, um, and to recognize that it's not just the WUI that is at risk. And so that cruise aware sign up is so important. Um, so here's my comment. It takes like a minute <laughs> to sign up for cruise aware. You can spend a little more time in there if you uh, want to use different features. Mm -hmm. There's a new feature that uh, you can get uh, you can sign up to get email alerts when con uh, prescribed burns are happening, good fire, you know, we're, we're heading into that season and, you know, at the city we get calls uh, when there's smoke and if you can get the alert in advance, you'll know what that is about. Um, my question is, uh, recognizing the role of Firewise communities, I know you work very closely with them and, you know, we've got an incredible network now within our county. Um, for folks who are interested in getting involved but may not have neighbors who are already active, do you have recommendations on how to connect uh, to be more engaged in on the, on the community side with FireWise or the Absolutely. Fire Safe Council. Thanks. Yes, no, great question, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, just like getting information on smoke alarms, um, FireWise is an NFPA program, so they can go to nfpa.org and click on FireWise. Um, but in, in the event they don't want to do that and they want more of that personal touch, they're more than welcome to come down to Fire Admin. Um, we can, what we try and do is connect people with the existing. They are the best spokespeople and they know how it works. Um, and we're just there to sort of facilitate and, of course, provide them tools and education. But we'll be more than happy if people have specific questions they don't get answered on the website. Just come visit us and our fire prevention team or any of our, our staff can help them um, sort of make that connection and get those created. And we want to, it's definitely been something that has grown not only in the city, but in the county. And so we just want to continue that momentum. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Watkins. Yes, thank you for your presentation, of course, and thank you for your for your work every day. Um, just building on the cruise where I, I know that schools also participate in the the great shakeout, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if maybe like the school system would help also get the awareness out about the cruise aware and and how like just as parents you can sign up. So any of those mass kind of mailing lists, hopefully some of those partnerships can support awareness and signups as well. No, that's a great suggestion. I'll take that back to our emergency manager and our communications team. Um, we're constantly trying to find ways to make yeah. those connections and conduct outreach. So um, we all, but we don't have all the answers. So I appreciate the feedback and the tip. And I want to thank you guys for the support. And I definitely want to thank um, Councilmember Brown and Golder for their participation in our open house and being in our dunk tank. And so thank you very much. Yes. Chief, I do have one other question. Yes. Can you, do you have any update on the litigation where uh, Mrs. O'Leary is suing the city of Chicago for defamation the, against the cow? The cow? I do not have an update, have an update on that update one. On that. Okay. Well, I think you, you asked last year, and I'll, I'll definitely work Thank on that one for you. Yes. Thank you, guys. Sir. Thank Appreciate you. It. All right. Uh, we are now moving on to item eight. This is a CARES and Act <coughs> Services update. Ms. Colburn, yes, no? Mayor, they, I don't Online. see them here. I have tried to contact them. We're a little ahead of schedule, so that might we are. be why. So. We'll come back to this. We'll come back to this. Let me know when they're available and we'll do that. We are on presiding, they're, excuse they're me. Coming up. We'll pause here for a second. I'm, I'm going to do some business here. Presiding officer announcements, none. Statements of disqualifications by members on the agenda, none. Additions or deletions on the agenda, 
None. Mr. Condotti, additions, deletions? I assume you're going to anticipate a closed session report at this point. Thank you. City Attorney report? Yes, there was one item on uh, this afternoon's closed session agenda, which was uh, in the courtyard conference room at 12.30 p.m. That was labor negotiations concerning all bargaining groups, and there was no reportable action. Okay, very good. Ms. Bush on the council calendar, anything you'd no like changes. to draw to our attention? No, thank you. Thank you. We are back on item eight. Ms. Coburn, welcome. Please come forward with your colleague and uh, all of your colleagues. And uh, thank you very much for being here. As she is approaching, I want to ask you if you would be kind enough to take back to the Board of Supervisors and the administration of the county our thanks and appreciation for the way uh, in the last 20 months, the city and the county have harmonized our work in the homeless space. And uh, you folks, as the primary provider of health and human services on behalf of the state and federal government, you do a terrific job on that, especially in the homeless space. We couldn't do our work without your work, and uh, we very, very much appreciate that. Please take that back to I Mr. Will. Palacios as well as the board members, and welcome. We are Thank very you. much anticipating hearing uh, an update on the CARES program. Great. Um, so I'm Nicole Coburn. I think I know all of you, but I'll introduce myself. I'm one of the assistant county administrative officers. I work in with the county's public safety and justice departments. And today I'll let my team introduce themselves too, but we have a very inter interdisciplinary team here today. We've been very collaborative in implementing Care Corps. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Megan Maravich, assistant county, county council. Um, our department will be representing the behavioral health agency, the petitioners in the care process. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Athena Reese. I'm the chief deputy at the public defender's office and we'll be representing the respondents or the citizens in need of supports in the community. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Brenda Campbell. I'm a behavioral health program manager overseeing our forensic programs. Thank you. We're going to go through our presentation, and um, if the clerk can go to the next slide, or do we control I think the slides you here? Feel okay, free to have Great. a seat. In for, please um, feel free. <laughs> County Council is going to start, and then we're going to each um, take a portion of the presentation. Very good. So the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Act, or CARE, is based on evidence that shows that many people can achieve stability and less restrictive environment in the community. And the CARE Act allows for eligible individuals who have untreated schizophrenia or other um, psychotic disorders to receive treatment and other resources in a court-monitored um, program. Um, here, I'd like to clarify a few key points. First, the CARE Act is distinguishable from conservatorships in that it is 100% voluntary. Participants must be willing to engage. Second, housing is not a guarantee for all participants. Behavioral health will be talking more about housing resources later in the presentation. Third, the CARE Act is only available for eligible individuals with specific psychotic disorders. To give you an overview of the participants in the CARE Act process, I will go through each of um, the, the people depicted on this slide here. First, there is the CARE Act participant. In court, we will sometimes refer to them as the respondent, and they are the community member in need of supports because they are suffering from a schizophrenic spectrum disorder or other psychotic disorder. There is also the petitioner. That's the person who files the petition on behalf of the community member in need of supports. Sometimes that will, that will be the behavioral health agency for the county. Sometimes that will be a family member or other qualifying petitioner. Finally, there is county behavioral health who will substitute in as a petitioner at the initial court appearance. Also, they are the agency that will be responsible for co coordinating with our community-based organizations to support the respondent in the community throughout the CARE Act process. And then finally, of course, there is the court and the judge who will make decisions based on the evidence provided after hearing from the parties at the CARE Act hearings. County Council will represent the Behavioral Health Agency. 
which will be substituted in as a petitioner throughout the CARE Act process. To qualify as a respondent for CARE Act services in a CARE Act petition, you must be somebody who is 18 years of age, suffering from a schizophrenia spectrum, spectrum disorder or other um, specified psychotic disorder. You have to be suffering from symptoms that interfere with your activities of daily living, such that your ability to function independently is at risk without supports and treatment. You have to be somebody who is not currently I apologize. Um, somebody who is not currently stable and engaged in voluntary treatment in the community, and that you're unable to survive safely and independently without treatment and supports, or your ability to do so is at risk without further um, treatment and supports that could be provided through the CARE Act process. Participation in the CARE Act is the least restrictive alternative. It's an alternative to more restrictive um, court processes, such as an LPS conservatorship, or even potentially incarceration, and the person will benefit from the CARE Act um, from participating in the care plan or care agreement through coordination and access to voluntary services within the community. As Athena had mentioned, that there are very um, narrow diagnoses that qualify for the CARE Act. So these are schizophrenia spectrum disorders or other psychotic disorders. Um, of note, uh, any psychotic disorder due to a medical issue is excluded, as is um, bipolar with psychotic features, which we see a lot of in this community. Um, so it's very narrow with schizophrenia and schizoaffective type disorders. Here we go. Okay, and the, so the petitioner. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of our petitioners, um, but it's um, people who might petition. And even though it does seem long, it is kind of narrow. Um, family members can petition, but then they have to be immediate family members or somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, or somebody um, who acts in a role of a caregiver or guardian. Um, it can be a mental health professional who has been treating somebody, but then it, they have to have treated the person within the last 30 days. <clears throat> the a director of a hospital, same thing. It has to be for somebody who is currently hospitalized or has recently been hospitalized there. Um, County Behavioral Health Agency is the only agency that does not have the timeline. Um, we can uh, be the petitioner at any time for somebody. And then first responders, outreach workers, um, roommates, and then the client that's themselves can actually be a respondent. Or a petitioner, sorry. So, once somebody has petitioned the court, um, behavioral health agency will be ordered to do an investigation. So we will try to find the person, look into their mental health history, see if they qualify under the diagnoses or under the 5250. Um, and then we will create a report for the court, letting the court know if they are eligible. <clears throat> if they are eligible, they will get a case manager and um, somebody will help them create a care plan and get them into treatment. If they are not eligible, County Behavioral Health will still outreach the person and try to get them the services that they do qualify for. Um, our community supports and services, so we contract our mental health services out to CBOs in the community, so we will be working with them. And then we also um, have uh, behavioral health bridge housing that is going to hopefully be opening in 2025, and our care participants will have priority uh, bed space there. And then we will connect them to the uh, housing continuum of care.
As Brenda mentioned, um, first responders in some circumstances may be CARE Act petitioners. Um, first responders, including peace officers, firefighters, paramedics, um, who have repeated interactions with a potential participant may file a petition. Um, all petitioners, including first responders, will be substituted out with county behavioral health to stand as the petitioner after the initial hearing. First responders may also make referrals directly to behavioral health or other mental health service providers. Um, these agencies should consider identifying a liaison within their organizations um, to support communication and the fer referral process. Before filing a CARE Act petition, um, the petitioners should consider reaching out to behavioral health for assistance in determining whether the respondent meets eligibility criteria. CARE petitions must include documentation of a qualifying disorder and an affidavit from a behavioral health clinician or proof of two recent hospitalizations for intensive treatment. Now I'll walk you through briefly the care process. Once a petition is filed, the court will review the petition and determine eligibility. Um, at that point, the public defender is appointed to represent the respondent. Um, if um, once they proceed to the, um, through the care process, the parties, including the respondent and the petitioner, will work together to try to create a care agreement or plan, which, is, um, which includes court-ordered services. Then the court will hold, hold periodic review hearings to track the participant's process, progress. And after 12 months, the participant may be eligible to graduate from care. Each participant will have their own individualized care plan specific to their needs. Both the participant and, the behavior, and behavioral health will be expected to comply with the expectations of the care agreement. It's not simply a list of demands that the participant has to follow. It includes services that they have the right to receive. The agreement may include behavioral health services, medication, housing resources, or supports and services will always be subject to available funding. I'm filling in for the court today regarding the court process. Um, the court does have um, a lot of information. Oh, there it is. Um, here, let's see. There's a lot of information that the court already has available, um, both the law library up here in Santa Cruz and their self-help center in Watsonville have all of the forms needed to file a care court petition. Um, the court has staff in both locations who've already been trained on assisting people within their, our community on how to fill out the documents. Um, they're able to both meet people in person and virtually if someone needs to meet remotely. And so the websites are shown here on this slide. If anyone who's watching wants to go see what's already online, they can also call both the Law Library and Self-Help Center um, to ask questions. And I think the court is well positioned to um, be implementing this effective the December 1st start date. So how to file a care court petition. Again, um, I mentioned the law library over at 701 Ocean Street and the self-help center. Um, they can go and they can complete the documents there um, and ask any questions that they might have. Uh, most clients are gonna be represented by our public defender's office who is representing um, CARE Act clients. Um, the county council, as Megan mentioned, is going to be representing um, county behavioral health. So in terms of our court partners, the judge really is there to serve as a neutral arbiter. Um, I wanna emphasize this is a voluntary program, so anyone who um, chooses to accept going through the CARE Act process um, acknowledges that they're doing this voluntarily. Um, these proceedings with the court um, are being strived to be conducted in a very informal, non-adversarial way. Um, they're hoping to meet clients where they're at. This might also include going to where clients are in the field and having conversations. I know that there are some counties in cohort one that are actually doing proceedings in the field. 
Um, they're trying to make it very accessible for folks so that um, we can ensure um, the best outcomes possible. Um, as I mentioned, County Council serves as the attorney for county behavioral health and ensures that all of the forms and documents are properly filled out. Um, public defender is the attorney for the person who's going through the CARE Act process and is gonna represent their interests and try to link that person with other services. So where can you find more out about CARE Act in addition to the court? Um, the county has stood up a website. Um, it's Santa Cruz County CA gov um, backslash care. We also have an email address that's monitored. So if someone has a real general question, they can email careact at santacruzcountyca.gov. Um, the state has a lot of resources online, and a couple of those websites are listed here. Um, with They have toolkits, forms, social media kits, all of it on their websites. Um, so that's been very helpful to us and to others who want to learn about it. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions you have. I'm sure you do. Um, but we're, um, thanks for having us today. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. Thank you to your colleagues who are here today. We very much appreciate that. Let me see if members have questions. Ms. Contar Johnson, then Ms. Bruner. Looks like we may have a fair number of questions, so we'll start with Ms. Contar Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation and the work um, across all the departments in the county. I know this was a huge lift and a huge ask from the state, so really appreciate the um, intentional, thoughtful work that's gone into this. I do have some questions. Um, does the, some of them are kind of nitty gritty. Does the respondent have to be diagnosed by the county? Do they have to have a diagnosis from the county? How do we confirm the diagnosis? So the diagnosis does not have to be from County of Santa Cruz. It does have to be from a licensed behavioral health professional. Okay. And how is that confirmed that, that, um, is the, is the petitioner have to provide the confirmed diagnosis? That is what the law says. Mm. So we have had discussions um, amongst this. So, so we did, we've been discussing this as a team, and it has been. If behavioral health is not the petitioner, it is really up to the judge. If uh -huh. if that proof isn't there, the affidavit or the fifty two fifty isn't in the petition, it's up to the judge to still order county behavioral health oh, to do the investigation, and then we would provide that information. And from our discussions last week, that's likely what our care act judge will be doing. I see. Okay. That's really helpful because that could be a real kind of stopping point. Um, I'll have, I have another behavioral health um, related question. How have we prepared um, our county behavioral health department to, um, I, I, I know the numbers won't be high, um, but the, the casework might be intensive. So how have we prepared ourselves in terms of capacity to do the case management and do create the case plans and work with these individuals? So we are still developing our workflows, but we have um, we have our CARE Act team, mm -hmm. and then we also have um, our iHeart team, which is their homeless outreach team. Um, and so we will work together mm -hmm. to ensure that all, all of the documents are completed that are expe expected, and then also to provide them the care. And with our behavioral health Bridge housing, there will be some on-site support. Okay. Um, and again, they get prior, priority bed space there. Okay, so that's my next question. Sorry, they all <laughs> seem to be for, for you. Um, but what, where, where are people staying physically while they're in this process? I understand that community service providers will be brought in, and that's another question. Have we identified potential community service providers? Um, we don't have to name them, but have we? Um, but, but it, you know, finding bridge housing or interim housing through community service providers may take a while. Do we have a, a physical space for folks to be at? Like when they first get petitioned and then they get into court? Is my question making sense? 
Yes, and we, right now, we do not. And is that a, a requirement of this CARE Act? No. Okay. Are other communities identifying a physical space for folks to be at? Do we know? Any other communities? Okay. Have? Okay. We're not sure. And, and have we identified community service providers that might be interested in working? We have. Yes. And we're, we're working with them to build their capacity. Yes. I'm asking these questions because I know how difficult it is to get these types of workers um, to do this really hard work. So yes. December 1st is around the corner, so that's why I'm asking these. Okay, um, just a couple of other questions. So I understand the definitions of who a petitioner can be, but conceivably any person who doesn't meet those definitions could go to a person that does and ask them to be a petitioner. Like let's say I have a neighbor and I believe they are on the schizophrenic spectrum. I don't live with them, I'm not a family member, but I can go talk to you know, the parent of that person, or, right? Con conceivably, yes. And, or a first responder for that matter. Or refer them to behavioral health. Or refer them willing. to behavioral health. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I think my last question for now is for our city, have we identified who our liaisons will be? I think we have, but what's our process? Yeah, I appreciate that question, uh, Councilmember Calentari Johnson. We met just recently with uh, Larry M. Wally, our Director of Homelessness Response, as well as Chief Escalante and uh, Cassie with the City Attorney's Office to start on that pre-coordination work. Uh, I believe the Chief has also had some engagement with the County Sheriff's Office as well, just coordinating with those individuals that our agencies are coming across on a, on a routine basis. Uh, but we will be working closely with the county. Uh, Larry and Wally will likely be our, our key lead and his team on homelessness response, uh, working, um, working with the county CAO's office as well as uh, their Housing for Health Division as well. Okay, great. I did actually have one more question. I forgot. Um, Nicole, I think you mentioned that um, we will be working across different programs and, and the probation mobile response um, program kind of came to mind. Um, can you just share a little bit about what we are doing at the county across departments to ensure that we're really leveraging all the resources and all, with all the various programs to do a robust implementation, sort of beyond the care court team? Yeah, I mean, this is the core team, but we've included probation, the sheriff, police departments, everyone is, uh, you know, who we could possibly imagine, the hospitals. Um, NAMI as part of this implementation development. And so I think we're trying to leverage services wherever we can and to make the most of what the county and others have to offer. So I would think that county behavioral health, I mean, they're very integrated with all other county services and know who to call when something's needed. So I think um, that's going to continue. Thank you so much. Council member. Brenner. Thank you. Um, thank you. One of my questions was answered, and that was who is our city liaison. Um, but is there data to show how many people would be eligible? What does that look like? Yeah, um, County Behavioral Health, and Brenda might speak to this tomorrow. They went through some of their, their own records that they have access to to try to identify based on the diagnoses what the caseload might be. Initially, we thought it was going to be larger as did the state, but we narrowed down to, we anticipate a population or a caseload of maybe about 30 people that they believe based on who they've seen come through or touches they've had in the community of folks that might be eligible. Um, so obviously it depends what we're actually seeing happen come December 1st, but we don't anticipate seeing hundreds of people go through this process. Um, and you know, if we encourage the city to think about this just in terms of, you know, the people you're interacting with. But the caseload we've projected is about 30. And is that 30 people across the county? Or what does it look like for the city of Santa Cruz just in a general ballpark? Are all 30 in the city of Santa Cruz? I don't know how it breaks down geographically. Brenda, do you? Yeah, no. no. And the outcomes of this 12-month process, if, if they continue through the 12 month and then are eligible to finish, what is that next step? What is the outcome here? Yeah, I mean, hopefully they would graduate from their care plan. Um, Brenda or, or even Athena have more details on what would happen. I think the goal is to get people housed 
Um, and then hopefully if they've completed 12 months successfully, the hope is, is that they're engaged enough that they will continue um, receiving services from us. Ideally, we're serving a population that's at risk for um, an LPS conservatorship, which would involve oftentimes placement in a locked facility. So the idea is that people who are on the cusp of being so unstable that they may then move into a, a more restrictive conservatorship are connected with services within the community such that they can function independently um, once this 12-month care act process is over. So the petition will be dismissed. Hopefully they have a place to live. They know how to reach out and get support from their providers and the organizations within the community that can support people who are suffering from um, symptoms of mental illness. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming over here and, and for your presentation. This was really helpful. A number of my, my questions were asked and answered. I guess my kind of following up on Councilmember Bruner's question is one of the questions I had was what like what does success look like? It, you know, what are the metrics of success of this program? And, and if I heard you correctly, it's it's housing, it's conservatorship. Um, I, I, is there others that people giving housed, people stabilizing, and whatever you know, whatever their diagnosis and situation is, and getting on a better path. Um, I think. It, would you want to add any other? Helping people avoid conservatorship mm -hmm. by oh, okay. empowering them to access supports that they need in the community to live independently. And I see. Okay, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Because some people, I think, do need conservatorship, and it's very um, restrictive in, in many ways. So, okay. And then are those being, will be tracked and measured over time to ensure that the program, given the robust um, partnership to run a program like that for a small caseload, is working? Yeah, we have pretty strict requirements from the state uh -huh. of the data that we have to track from the beginning of care um, to a year after. Okay, got it, for a year after. Wonderful. Um, I had a question around when there's dual kind of use, there's drug use and schizophrenia, and, and where would that individual potentially fall in terms of eligibility and structure? If they have co-occurring disorders um, and the mental health diagnosis is um, schizophrenia spectrum, then they would they would qualify. Okay. But substance use does not disqualify somebody. And yet you still consider only 30 for your amount of people that you identify in that category in the county? Because <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a behavioral health person, but it, you do see um, behaviors that to a lay person would look almost like schizophrenia that's been drug induced or there's dual use. Yes, and that, so if somebody on the diagnoses, it showed that actually um, substance induced psychotic disorder is actually a one of the psychotic spectrum disorders that they that qualify. I see. Um, however, once they, if they stabilize and they're not using and they don't have symptoms anymore, then that would, they would graduate earlier than the I see. six months if they've stabilized and are not uh, meeting the criteria for Maybe. substance use disorder, yeah. I see, okay, yeah. okay. So then um, I guess that was also part of my other question, which was, um, who, it seems very restrictive in who's eligible and, and meeting that criteria, um, but it did reference other disorders. So, but then you had a disclaimer that it wasn't like bipolar or uh, so. What types of other disorders be, be, beyond schizophrenia would qualify? I can. So, some of the other disorders that do qualify are uh, schizoaffective, schizophrenic form, um, other specified schizophrenia mm -hmm. disorders, and unspecified schizophrenia, along with brief psychotic disorder, delusional disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, um, substance or medication induced psychotic disorder, catatonia associated with another mental disorder, and unspecified catatonia. Hmm. Okay. I think, I think what we're going to see 
most of is the, the schizophrenia spectrum disorders. That makes sense. And then in terms of the people that don't qualify but could benefit, are there systems or, you know, the continuum of resources? How do you build that into the, the care court structure? So our hopes is when behavioral health is doing the investigative report and we see that somebody might have a diagnosis or have those functional impairments that would um, rule them into our services, our hope is that we can still engage them. They just wouldn't be part of the CARE Act process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That, that, that question. For the questions, comments by members. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. Thank you to each of you. Uh, we know that in California we have challenges in the space of homeless folks experiencing homelessness. And uh, I think over the years, uh, state and local governments have come to the conclusion that there are many, many approaches that need to be made here. And uh, I think we should be, without committing the sin of pride, proud of the way our community views folks experiencing homelessness, that they are experiencing a wide variety of challenges in their life, and so a wide variety of approaches and assistance and help in various ways is appropriate. And the county government provides so much leadership on that, so many programmatic approaches, so much money that you put into it, and people with big hearts and keen minds such as you folks who are here today. So thank you very, very much for your excellent work. Thank you for being here. We are on the consent agenda. This is, I don't feel any need to remain. <laughs> we appreciate your presence. Uh, we are on the consent agenda. This is, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, we will be taking up items 10 through 13 inclusive on our agenda on one motion. What I will do is ask members if they have questions, comments, or wish to pull an item. I will then ask the public for their comments on items on the consent agenda. If you do wish to comment on the consent agenda, you will have the opportunity to comment for three minutes on all items inclusive, 10 through 13. Let me start with my colleagues. I'll start with Mr. Newsom on the consent agenda, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I just want to make a very quick comment on item 13. Please make that comment. Thank you. I just want to thank staff for all of their work uh, on this project and just ask if they continue working with the property owner. Thank you. Ms. Brown. I echo that and want to say uh, a special thanks to uh, Director Wynn and to Mr. Crossley for the conversation, uh, for being willing to have that conversation. <laughs> um, and I, you know, really a thank you, is, it doesn't seem like sufficient expression of gratitude for the extra time that you've put in to make this work uh, for this particular project. And um, I just, and, and also to our city manager for uh, stepping in and we had a conversation about the the bigger picture here I think that the um, while we're not really doing much differently the um, the conversation was very productive for thinking and, and trying to figure out how to support the additional costs related to this project for the property owner um, and uh, so that it, and, and maintaining the you know, limiting the city's staff time that has um, to, to make this happen. So I just, like, I really can't thank you enough. You're very generous with your time uh, and willingness uh, to, to work through this one. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. I don't have any comments on Thank you. The Vice, excuse me, Vice Mayor Contar Johnson. Okay. Council Member Brenner. My goodness. <laughs> oh, it was an efficient operation today. All right. Let me see if there's anyone with us who wishes to comment on the consent agenda. Any item is fair enough. Welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Mr. Ewing, how are you today? Okay. Um, I appreciate you asking. It's, yes. I'm working with my own Confederacy of Dunces. Okay. I'm doing great at it. So uh, I want to comment on the minutes and then number 11 which has to do with funding. Yes, sir. I'll be brief about number 11. There seems to be some interesting questions about funding going on. 
I'll leave it at that because right. I don't know any more than that. Right. So as far as the minutes, it may have seemed like I was telling a joke that things had changed when, you know, we have 30 minutes for public comments. But it's arbitrary. It used to be two minutes to three minutes. You used to be able to pull items off the consent agenda um, and talk for three minutes on those. Where's the timer? Okay. So I was late. Didn't want to be late. And I, but I think that it's so destructive to not be able to make comments, particularly on the CARES Act. And I know keeping. On topic, I can't really make comments on the CARES Act, but I would sure like to because I was here last year. So I guess that's all I have to say. I wish I had been here on time. And I, I think the public should be able to comment on the proclamations because some are really important, like that one. I did thank the women for what the individuals for what they said, but I would have loved to have had three minutes to comment on that because it's a really critical issue that's being swept under the rug. Thank you. Mr. Ewing, thank you, sir. Anyone online, Ms. Bush, with their hand up on, on the consent agenda? No one. Anyone else with us wish to comment on the consent agenda? Seeing here none, the matter is back before the body. Pleasure of the body. Vice Mayor moves. Ms. Watkins seconds. Approval of the consent agenda as presented, and the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent, and Mayor Keeley. All right. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 14. Item 14 is housing and urban development pathways to removing obstacles to housing grant program. We have a staff report and other additional materials in our agenda. Ms. Wise, excuse me, Dr. Wise West is going to be presenting on this item. Yes, hello, Council. We ha actually have no presentation for you. Uh, this is bringing back a project uh, that we brought to you about a year ago in round one. And uh, it contains several elements. It was a collaboration between economic development and housing, the planning department, public works, and the city manager's office. Um, it has been revised to meet the new HUD requirements for this round. It includes an anti-displacement policy evaluation and roadmap, an affordable housing decarbonization roadmap, standing up, seeding, and creating sustainable funding for an affordable housing and resilience fund, incentivizing and streamlining single family neighborhoods, a variety of housing with policy tools, and transportation elements to connect intersections in uh, target communities and opportunity areas for jobs, education, and public safety, and expanding uh, Go Santa Cruz as an alternative. So really a multifaceted project. We were only three points from missing the funding in round one, and we did get a debrief with HUD, and so we feel really confident coming in, especially with the uh, substantial match that many of the transportation grants that the city has um, that is bringing to this, which is adding additional points. So that's my report to you about this, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. We do have uh, a number of collaborative partnerships um, included with this uh, and follow up from an, uh, uh, a bunch of research or uh, uh, outreach that we've done uh, with the community and beach flats in particular. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Let me see if there are questions by members on this item. Uh, I do have a question. I'm wondering, uh, it says that HUD has six goals for this competition, and on page 14.3 of our general packet, which is the third page of your item, uh, it mentions if awarded funding, the project will result in three specific outcomes. Number one is roadmaps for anti-displacement policies and decarbonizing existing housing. On, let me go to a specific clause in there, and that is the question about the anti-displacement policies. It does seem to me, I'm, I'm interested in your response, it does seem to me that that may be an area where if we receive this grant, it may be good to get a bit formal with this in terms of getting some broader or broad based community input on that particular issue of anti-displacement. Uh, 
And what I would be interested in doing is uh, when we get to a motion on this uh, to add uh, to this uh, the city's uh, the city council's intention if we should receive that grant to establish an anti-displacement fill in the blank working group doesn't need to be a commission certainly but some kind of working group and we would agree on how to populate that and so on would that uh, be consistent or inconsistent with where you're trying to go on this it, it certainly is consistent and i will also say that there is a a, a, a lot of funding budgeted or outside groups to advise on this. So um, I think we can have a very uh, diverse group advising. Yes, I think that's very consistent. Very good. I think we will, uh, I, I, I would hope when the maker of the motion on, on uh, this item would include that as an additional action. Is there further debate or discussion? Ms. Brown. Uh, I, I do have a question um, and want to thank the mayor for raising uh, the first item because I also um, am interested in that. Um, in terms of number four, uh, which is, I'm going to go back and look at the, your goal number four. It's a, I'm looking at the agenda report, the top of page three of the agenda report. Um, incentivizing and streamlining a greater variety of housing within single family neighborhoods using policy tools including expansions, so including, and then you go on, and there's some, some examples here. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you can speak to how uh, the, the tools that the city is looking at differ or expand upon the state laws that have already really opened up single family zoned neighborhoods to all of these things. So what else are we talking, looking at here? So thank you for that question, council member. I'm going to ask Lee Butler to respond to that. Um, this was is not my area of expertise, and as this was a collaborative proposal, I would um, prefer that he uh, address your question. Thank you, Dr. Weiss-West. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, uh, Pat Benoit, Principal Planner for Advanced Planning. I, I can speak to that, Tiffany. Um, Tiffany's group coordinated quite a bit with us on this process. This was a, a originally a project that we had, uh, tried to receive grant funding for through the REAP 2.0 grant, which went to council about a year ago, August 2023. And this was really to look at single family zoning through the lens of all these various state laws that have, that have happened over the years and kind of changed what's allowed there and uh, really figure out how to create more design requirements around them to both uh, be more flexible in how you could achieve a three or four unit project to potentially be more residential in nature uh, under the current state laws that already allow those units. And then to also explore expanding options uh, that are also uh, potentially part of state or also potentially allowed under state law through like up to six units or eight units, depending on if it's near transit, things like that. So we had a few goals in the housing element to explore those options, in addition to just creating better design guidelines around what's already allowed per state law. And so the goal there was really to uh, see if we, you know, explore if we could densify in some areas of single family but to also make it much, make all the state laws much more user friendly for people to actually look into those options and add more units to their existing properties. Councilmember Brown, further on this item? Thanks. Further. Anyone wish to comment on this item? This would be your opportunity to do so. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do. Okay, Mr. Ewing on this item, sir? Yes. Please feel free. Free to approach. Thank you. This is a fascinating subject. I think about a year ago this was brought up. From what I recall, you know, it was maybe changes were going to be made so that a single family dwelling could uh, house 10 families. And my question was, where are they going to park? I think that was the subject about a year ago. Anyway, this is quite. Fascinating. I'm glad, Mr. Keeley, that you brought up, oh, where is it, roadmaps about decarbonization. 
Well, you know, I don't really want to quote myself for what I said in the supervisor's meeting today, but I'll try. You know, I was talking to those seven men. I said, you know, five years ago, the third leading cause of death was Western medicine doctors. Here we are five years later, second leading cause of death is Western medicine doctors. And the first leading cause of death is men like you seven. So, and it's, it was something like that, and that's about what I said. Uh, so this is just really kind of interesting because the words like suppose, state authority and stuff, this is all the consolidation and the only carbon that's really being successful at being eliminated are the humans by their own lack of education and just believing authority, which often doesn't have their best interest in mind. So to stay more on topic with all this zoning requirements, hey, you know, look at what's going on in this town. We've got all these superstructures. I remember less than a year ago at 7.45 in the morning, attempting, well, walking into the building department, and they had a brick in the door because none of the personnel that worked there could get in with their electronic keys. Right over there. So, hey, it's not that funny because what's going on right now with the control and thinking that the, you know, the electronics are actually going to be our friend and all these things, there's just a lot of underhanded conversations about what supposedly is the best for the people. Mm. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. First online, good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Good afternoon. I'm sorry, say it again. Excuse me. I I said, this is me. I'm not there yet. It's, oh, uh, fine. Quite fine. Okay. Very good. Person with, uh, with your hand up online, good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Yeah, hi. Yeah, this is Garrett. Hey, I'm continually amazed at how many flavors of ill-tasting leftist narratives can be combined into any one agenda item, but the CAM is always on that job. No worries, there's very little chance of seeing any of this money since HUD has extended the deadline for these grants to apply to the seven states affected by Hurricane Helene. That's Helene. Uh, also, since FEMA spent all their money on illegal, illegal aliens, they say they can't fund American disasters for Americans and will surely suggest emptying this grant to do so. The specific interpretation of the summarized purpose of this grant and how you would implement such, we never really see as the actual grant application details or know the commitments it makes are a mystery. Unless I have that wrong, and that's the actual <laughs> application in the packet, but you know, I don't think it is. Uh, is a link to the real application uh, too much trouble? We already have many laws that eliminate purposeful discrimination via segregation. Perhaps your version of segregation is demographics not meeting your race quotas? Do tell. Do you really think there are any, I mean any, whatsoever obstacles not created by the government itself for able people to obtain housing that they would like to afford except for their personal lack of money and income? I'm not talking about the disabled, many challenged or the sick, I mean everybody else. Before taking the big outside grant money with its hidden obligations and quizzling like bidding of the feds money talking, which is not necessarily the will of the locals here, which creates an ever bigger, relatively outsized and intrusive and expensive government, which it then whines about when it runs out of money, perhaps you'd care to share the actual specifics of what barriers this intends to correct to so-called outdated zoning or land use policies or regulations or inefficient procedures, identify outdated, define inefficient, identify which gaps and available resources for what kind of development you'll be targeting, which deteriorating or inadequate infrastructure you will target, which lack of neighborhood amenities do you identify, or which actual not climate change grift narrative-based challenges exist to the preservation of existing housing stock or redevelopment pressures, please identify and at least define uh, or which expiration of affordable requirements you will target. Do tell now, not later, after the obligations and changes have the wet signatures. Perhaps explain the difference between the expiration of affordable requirements and the expiration of affordability agreements. Uh, I'm not sure you know the difference after last meeting. Do you really think affluent neighborhoods have some magic there that is being denied to poorer people that if only they lived there, they too would get some of the magic and they'd be affluent and have benefits of this so-called 
you know, opportunity zone that is denied them, and then some social justice would be rectified. Is the air there different? Is it the water? Is it racism? Is it white privilege? Is it climate change? The summary punchline was saved for last in this uh, summary as it should be. Excuse me, approval of this recommendation will not result in an immediate fiscal impact to the general fund. Ha ha, it's a good one since it refers to creation of a fund. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Three, two. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and city council. This is Judy Grunstra. I kind of agree with Garrett there. He said it with a lot more words than I'm prepared to say. Uh, when I see, you know, this grant for removing obstacles, uh, I assume that means doing away with single-family zoning. Perhaps it's already been um, demonized. And, uh, you know, we, we live in neighborhoods, not opportunity zones. Uh, you know, I hesitate to even, you know, use the word help us protect our neighborhoods because I'll be accused of nimbyism or racism or something like that, and that is not the case. Um, so if you do get the grant and spend nearly half a million dollars in staff labor, uh, we'd look to you, council, to help us protect our neighborhoods. You know, we're not demonizing any demographic people, but, um, you know, the state has taken away so much control, so please use whatever control you have to, you know, keep Santa Cruz. I know it's changing, but, you know, Single-family neighborhoods are not the tool of the devil. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? No. Matters back before the body, Ms. Brown. I'd like to uh, move the staff recommendation to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to apply for, accept, and appropriate funds uh, from, and with the rest of the language there, uh, uh, with the following changes. One, um, in the in the proposed project number one at the bottom of page two, uh, the item the element for producing an anti-displacement policy evaluation and roadmap, I would like to add language uh, that com to a, add a, a in quote a commitment to establish an anti-displacement working group or committee that would include identified partners in the grant as well as at-risk residents and to this I'm going out on a limb on this one uh, delete item number four regarding single-family neighborhoods uh, I believe the state has already done away with single-family zoning uh, through SB 9 SB 10 and ADU law so uh, oops, I'm sorry I'm, I'm waxing forth on my motion so the motion was I'll stop <laughs> with uh, delete number four regarding single-family neighborhoods okay so I'll make sure we've got this this is adopt the staff recommendation with two additional actions one is on item one at the bottom of 14.2 which would add some kind of uh, displacement entity here at the city level and delete item four at the top of page 14.3 in our agenda packet. That is the motion. Is there a second? I'll second for purposes of discussion. Ms. Brown, on your open, uh, please open on your motion. Thank you. And I apologize for not sending it over. It was sort of thinking as I as we as I listened um, Bonnie I'm happy to send it if it would be helpful uh, so the uh, the reason that I uh, you know I, I heard you mayor uh, say that you were interested in uh, some kind of uh, working group or committee to pursue uh, this question of, of displacement uh, this is something that our planning commission at least some members of our pr previous planning commissions uh, had recommended and it never came forward to the city council level. Um, I have my own thoughts on the reasons why, but I'll leave that for the moment and just say, I think that this is something that um, would be really important. If we wanna have a policy framework or a roadmap, um, we ought to be including the folks who really are experiencing this and the community partners that work with those uh, members of our community. 
and um, you know we can we can have a, a policy with a checklist, um, but that doesn't mean that displacement isn't going to continue happening. And so I think the more we have you know an active uh, effort that the city can support through funding like this grant. Um, all the better. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the overall intent of this grant and, and the proposal that's been put together. Um, I, and for on the second uh, request, or the second part of my motion, deleting this item for regarding uh, incentivizing and streamlining a greater variety of housing within single family neighborhoods uh, using policy tools. Um, I, the reason that I, I I see that as unnecessary is that we already have that framework in place. The state laws have uh, allow for uh, multifamily, uh, you know, all of the things that are listed here allows for lot splits, allows for duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, junior ADUs, ADUs, etc. Um, and so, really. Uh, I think that <laughs> I, I don't know that we. Th this is a case where um, you know I, I disagree with the idea, the notion that we would want to, uh, as a local jurisdiction, give away even more authority, um, you know, s further streamline beyond what the state has already asking us to do. I think those tools are in place, and it's just a matter of figuring out how to navigate them here at the local level. Um, so. That, that's my rationale. I think everything else in this is 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 awesome. Uh, you know, it, I want to remind us that this is uh, um, removing barriers to affordable housing grant, not a removing barriers to ho any and all housing. Um, I do not share our planning department's assumption that any new housing will be a, is going to be affordable um, if it's smaller or um, you know on a you know, in, as an ADU in the back of a, a private property. We've, we've seen the results of that, and we know that um, ADUs are not affordable housing, and they've been moved back and forth in the categories in our housing element, I think, as part of a shell game to demonstrate that we've got more affordable housing than we actually have. So um, until there's some requirement that those units be affordable, uh, we're not, th that effort would not lead to more affordable units it might lead to more housing, but I think the tools are already there. So that's my rationale. Thanks. Ms. Contar Johnson is recognized. Councilmember Brown, I'm going to miss not agreeing with you on this um, when you come off the um, dais. Um, I, I disagree on that point. I do think all housing is needed, certainly affordable housing, but housing at all levels. And what I remember from working on the housing element subcommittee with Councilmember Newsom and Mayor Keeley is that this specific piece, um, a big part of it is around, I don't know if it's specifically objective standards, and I see um, Matt Van Wan, Lee Butler standing there, making they, they can speak to it, but a big part of it is developing standards that would give us more local control for state laws that are in place. So SB9, SB10s, how can we take control and ensure that this is going to work for our neighborhoods? So that's how I understand this specific number four piece. Um, that was the work that we did in the Housing Elements Subcommittee. That was part of what the REAP 2.0 um, grant was about, and, and I don't know if you would like to come up and, and, and say more to that piece. Am I correct in that? Is, that? is it essentially creating objective standards for these SB9, SB10s? Mr. And, and sorry, and, and, and I'll just say that I would be in support of um, the uh, motion if number four were put back in, because I'm in support of the first part. Mr. Venois, on the narrow question the member asked you. Correct. It, it would be creating those objective standards. The goal was to create a guidebook to more easily use all these various state laws that are currently kind of disparate and don't connect very well with neighborhood design. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bruner? I, I, can I just respond, just to get this done? Because I, I want to just make, is that okay? Um, thank you, uh, I appreciate. So um, that's, I understand that, but that's not what this says. This says incentivizing and streamlining. It doesn't say uh, developing objective standards to ensure we can use those state laws. Um, so I'd like some clarification. It, I, mean, I hear the intent, but I, I also see the language here. Um, and I'm willing to withdraw that part of the motion, but 
I, I'm concerned about the way it's currently worded. Mr. Butler on the question. Good afternoon, Mayor Good afternoon, Councilor, Councilor. Council Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, to speak to that a little bit um, differently, and um, uh, you had the question about um, you know, how it will um, play out in relation to state law. The distinction here is you know, four units can be allowed on a single family property right now, but the state specifies exactly how that happens. So in addition to the guidebook that Matt talked about that we would develop, there would also be uh, regulations that say, here in our community, you can get those four units. They are going to be, they can be um, uh, organized on the site in a manner that we believe is more compatible with the, the surrounding neighborhood than what would otherwise be the case as part of a state mandate. So this, this would streamline those things um, and it would encourage them in that manner um, because someone could take advantage of our approach, which we believe we can come up with a, a fourplex approach that would be better than what the one size fits all uh, requirements throughout the state are. And then we would have the regulation, the guidebooks saying, you could do it this way according to the state or you could do this design that is allowed here locally. I, great, um, again, it, like it would just be helpful to be clear about that because I even read through the proposal and that was not the impression that I got in my read and so you know I'm I if, it, if it's about making giving us more control or, or more authority to determine how these state laws are, are um, implemented locally that's a very again a very different question um, so you know I guess I'll I'm willing to withdraw that, but um, you know, with the, cons I'll, I'll leave the concern in place that um, future councils are going to potentially get proposals that say, "Well, you invited, you you approved, you know, incentivizing beyond the state law. You in, you have agreed to do this." So, again, I'm I just I feel like it opens a door that um, is not necessarily something that. Well, maybe members of this council do want to open. Um, if it again, if it's about just rationalizing the use of state law, I wish it had said that. Would have been helpful. Thanks. Let me reset ourselves to make sure I know where we are. Are you withdrawing your motion? I, I'm willing to do that if I'm not going to get the votes for <laughs> leaving it in well, there. Anyway, so the thanks. Term, that is to move to a vote. So I want to know what you want to do. You tell me what you want to do. I, I'll just withdraw it. Okay. It's even easier. Entire, I don't want to have the entire motion. No, I'll, I would leave the num part one in place. I will withdraw my second piece of the modification, which is related to number four. Very good. Bonnie's got it. Agreeable to the second. Agreeable to the second, which is me. <laughs> so we are. Uh, we now have a revised motion. Good on that. Very good. Okay. Now so we're going can to I go just through. confirm that I'm still sorry. includes the establishment of the anti. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> yes, Ms. Bruner. Thank you. I think we've landed. Um, I was also going to speak to this number four and. Um, ask for that clarification, but in looking at the HUD guidelines and um, number four and how, you know, it, the diversity of housing options in our city and that control and removing any barriers um, to segregation and to vulnerable populations, I think number four is essential. And um, if we've landed at this place in the motion, then I'm happy to support it. Councilmember Watkins. Um, thank you for, thank you for the presentation and the overview. I agree that I feel the language doesn't really reflect what the sentiment is in number four and actually was supportive of saying how we can more clearly explain that in our direction to staff. Um, I think for the reasons that have been referenced personally, if it is truly about compatibility to neighborhood and um, refining our code to reflect that and encourage that, that's different than how it, I think it's, it, for, for me, it also reads for number four. So I am 
interested in seeing if there's a way to reframe that language to be more clear about what the intention is behind that. Um, and I'll just provide a little bit of history, I guess, is, you know, serving on the blueprint for housing, knowing that it was way before a lot of the state law that, you know, has passed since then, there really was an interest in wanting to preserve neighborhoods and see development in the downtown to have expansion of ADUs and, and that we've lost our, a lot of our control at the local level, but do know that we have to be in compliance with state law. So as a result, how can we make it work for Santa Cruz? And I think that's where we're at right now. And so if that's what we're trying to do with that, this specific direction, then I think it makes sense for us to try to be clear about that. So I don't know if Lee and Matt are working their magic and possible language change over there, um, but I think that would be m most appropriate in my opinion, given what I heard is the intention behind number four. Thank you. Mr. Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I don't um, have much to add outside of what's been said, but I do agree, associate myself with uh, Councilmember Watkins uh, notion, uh, sentiment to try to work on this language a little bit to more reflect what we were told, uh, what, what this is about. Thank you. Mr. Butler, let me recognize you. I think you hear a sentiment of where the council would like to go on this. Do you have some language that might be helpful? Perhaps um, at the end of that first sentence, um, in a manner, so I'll read the whole sentence so you, in case you don't have it in front of you. Incentivize and streamline a greater variety of housing and high opportunity areas by developing policy tools to support the expansion of allowances for duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and more on property currently zoned for single family uses. And adding the language in a manner that maintains compatibility with the surrounding single family neighborhoods. I would even start with that, frankly. I mean, in a manner to make, maintain compatibility and then go from there. <laughs> yeah, I think putting, that's the putting that clause at the beginning. Correct, yeah. Okay. So let me, exactly. let, no side conversation. Sorry. Let's make sure we do this all publicly. All right, so uh, your language, I want to make sure Ms. Bush gets that. No, I understand you don't. <laughs> so I'm going to do this. We are getting close to our afternoon recess. I think what might be helpful here, we will do all the public's business in public. I'm going to take a recess now for about 10 minutes. I want to give you folks the opportunity to have a little conversation about the language issue here. Then we will go back into session. We'll pick this up uh, and hear what that language is. We'll do all the public's business in public, but let's do the actual writing. Let's take a minute uh, here. So we are going to take our afternoon recess. We will come back at 3.35. That'll give you about eight minutes to, to work on that, and then we'll resume the business. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session following our afternoon recess. We are on item 14. There was a motion and a second and debate and discussion and then some further colloquy among members. We took a brief recess. We think that before we took recess that there was general understanding of what the uh, uh, Ms. Brown may want to uh, now propose as a motion. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I want to thank our planning staff and city attorney for taking that time during the break to revise our um, uh, recommendation. So we now have a clear explanation of what the intention is with the single family neighborhoods policy tools. Um, so it's here and folks can read it. And Ms. Brown, while members are looking at that, uh, would I be correct in believing that in number two, actually above, is where the anti-displacement language now exists? Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is now in number okay. two um, to identify partners. Um, it's, Very good. It, I just, to, not to quibble too much, but I want to be clear, to identify 
partners in the in uh, partners identified in this grant in the grant proposal and at risk residents. Uh, and it would really be for, for inclusion in, yeah, for, for inclusion. Or a, actually working group to include instead of identify. Working group to include partners identified in grant proposal. There we go. Clarity. Okay. There's the motion. Very good. <laughs> Very good. And, uh, and number three now is written the way, okay. Ms. Contra, had enough time, everybody had enough time. Ms. Brown, do you have a motion? That is my motion. There is the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Watkins. Debate or discussion on the motion. Let me see if there's anyone with us who wishes to make comment on this motion. This would be your opportunity to do so. Seeing and hearing none. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ewing. I just want to recognize thanks for the opportunity. I'm not going to do it. Thank you, sir. You're certainly welcome. Matters back before the body. There's a motion, a second. All debate having ceased. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkin. Aye. Brunner. Aye. Helen Terry Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. And Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes. <laughs> is ordered. Thank you for all of your work. Many people participated in this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your accommodation as well during today's meeting. We're on item 15. This is uh, an item brought to us by Planning and Community Development. Uh, it uh, relates to amending a large number of ordinances and actions of this body. There's a full staff report in our agenda packet. Ms. Stanger and Mr. Van Waal will be presenting on this item, and good afternoon to you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Clara Stanger, Senior Planner, Department of Planning and Community Development. Today I'm presenting proposed changes to the city's regulations for accessory dwelling units, or ADUs. Um, so there's two ordinances before you. They make several proposed changes to the city's ADU regulations. These, regulate, these changes include permanently adopting an urgency um, ordinance that was passed a couple of years ago to keep the regulations consistent with state law, and this needs to be adopted by December of this year. Additional minor changes to keep the regulations consistent with state law. Changes to improve clarity of the existing regulations. Removal of owner occupancy requirements and a new requirement for ADUs to enroll in the Residential Rental Inspection Services Program and new proposed provisions that would allow for the separate sale of ADUs. I'm gonna give you a bit more description now on the owner occupancy, rental inspection changes, as well as the separate sale of ADUs proposal. Okay, so owner occupancy is where the property owner is required to live on the property, either in the main house or in the ADU. Currently, the city requires owner occupancy for single family home properties with ADUs constructed before 2020, um, but the city waives that requirement for sites with ADUs constructed in 2020 or later. The proposed amendments would remove owner occupancy requirements for all ADUs, including those built prior to 2020. There are approximately 550 ADUs that were built between 1985 through 2019. Um, averaging to about 15 ADUs per year. Um, as the ADUs, ADU rules have become much more flexible in recent years at both the state and local level, ADU development has accelerated considerably. The city has issued about 375 ADU building permits since the start of 2020 or at a rate of approximately 75 permits per year. At this rate, within three years, there will be more ADUs built in 2020 or later than the pre-2020 ADUs. Since the number of ADUs approved after 2020 will soon overtake and probably eventually dwarf the number of pre-2020 ADUs, retaining the owner occupancy requirements on these pre-2020 ADU properties would unfairly punish these owners who are early adopters of this housing concept. Removing the owner occupancy requirement will create fairness across the board for all properties with ADUs. 
Um, I want to note that um, staff have heard many times from these existing ADU owners that they want this restriction removed. Um, and then the removal of owner occupancy would be coupled with a requirement that all ADU properties be enrolled in the Residential Rental Inspection Services Program. This program is required for all rentals throughout the city and ensures that basic health and safety standards are maintained for rental dwelling units. Staff has found that health or safety issues can exist in an ADU, regardless of whether or not an owner is present. Um, and we believe that ADUs should therefore be a part of this program, whether or not the owner is living on the property. The program requires a small annual fee and small inspection fee, um, but self-inspection is possible in many cases, which reduces fees. Also, in some cases, fees and inspections are waived entirely, for example, for units that are not rented, um, or if a family member is living in the unit, um, or if the unit is rented through the housing choice vouchers, in which case it would be inspected um, through the housing authority. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to the separate sale of ADUs. AB 1033 is a state law that allows a local jurisdiction to create an ordinance to allow ADUs and their associated primary dwellings to be mapped as condominiums and sold separately. So why should we do this? It creates more variety in our housing market. The city has only been exclusively approving rental housing for the last several years. Um, and ownership housing is an important component of our housing market. It also um, would create an opportunity to create ownership units that are lower cost by nature compared to a single family dwelling. Um, I have a personal story here. Um, I um, was recently on a house hunt for a starter home. I have two small children. Um, there are no starter homes. <laughs> there are very, very few starter homes in the area. Um, and the time frame I was looking, there were no homes in my price range in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we ended up purchasing a mobile home that has a very small backyard, so at least my two children have a, a small place to play outside. An ownership ADU would be a great place for a growing family or a, a family with small children with a yard where the kids can play outside. Um, so I think it would be a great addition to the housing market and a great way to support young families in Santa Cruz. Okay, um, off my pedestal now. <laughs> so how would this work? Um, first, um, what this does not do, it does not allow for more ADUs than what are already allowed to be constructed on a site. What it does do is it gives owners options to either rent or sell their ADU. This ordinance would typically be utilized by a single family home with an ADU, but it could apply to multifamily sites as well. The proposed ordinance will allow all ADUs on the site to each be mapped as condominiums. If there is an associated primary dwelling, such as a single family home, that would also be mapped as a condominium. On a site with multiple rental units, those other rental units would all collectively be mapped as one condominium. Under the proposed ordinance, projects with four or fewer condominiums, such as sites with a single family home or a duplex and associated ADUs, um, the proposed ordinance includes a streamlined ministerial parcel map approval. Staff already has this type of review process in place for SB9 projects, so it would be easy to implement for ADU condominiums. Um, we'll probably see fewer projects that have five or more condominium units, but in that case, there would be a separate higher level of review. One question that staff considered is, what is gonna happen to the tenant of an existing ADU if it is converted into a condominium to be sold? So currently, converting existing rentals to condominiums is only possible when at least 67% of the units are purchased by the tenants. This rule is really intended to apply to larger multifamily projects, and staff feels it's important here to make a distinction between those larger developments and the smaller projects that we'll, we will likely see under this ordinance, such as a single family home or duplex that have one to three ADUs on the site. So um, these, like I said, these ADU ownership units are an important um, thing to add to our housing market, and we feel that on these smaller projects, um, that the benefit of creating these ownership units could outweigh the concerns of displacing renters. With that being said, in order to strike a balance, 
the ordinance proposes to increase tenant displacement assistance when it comes to converting these existing ADUs to create four or fewer condominiums. The proposed ordinance would increase relocation assistance requirements from one and a half months up to four months, and it would require the owner to give the tenant um, a first right of refusal to purchase the unit if it were listed for sale on the open market. Staff feels that this is a good compromise between creating more availability in the ownership market and providing more displacement assistance than we currently have. For projects that would have five or more ADU condominiums, conversion of the existing ADUs to condominiums could only take place if those ADUs were purchased by 67% of the existing tenants. So that would continue um, the city's existing regulations in that case. Okay, so moving on to community feedback. Staff engaged with the community several times over the summer and gathered some feedback. On August 15th, we held a community meeting. On August 23rd, we gave a talk with the Santa Cruz County Association of Realtors. And on September 19th, we were at the West Side Engagement Community Meeting and spoke with residents. Um, one anecdote from the West Side Engagement Meeting came from a lady who said she will need to move to a nursing home in the next few years. She has an ADU on her property, but she needs to rent out the house to pay for the nursing home. So increased flexibility for these own homeowners in this case by removing the owner occupancy requirement can help them in a variety of situations. Um, we've heard from other owners about the ADU ownership option. Uh, more people want to age in place and want to have an ADU that they could live in or use for income and the ownership option offers more flexibility and another way for people to age in place. We've also heard from people who are upset that their kids can no longer own property in Santa Cruz. Um, so the creation of ADU condominiums could be a great way to bring back starter homes. Staff took the proposed ordinances to Planning Commission on September 5th. The Planning Commission agreed with staff's recommendation for approval. Um, but the commission had also received a comment letter from the California Housing Defense Fund that questioned the legality of some of the proposed changes. So the commission directed staff to do further research and make any needed changes to comply with state law. Staff consulted with the city attorney and the State Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD, and we made one change as a result. While HCD had previously advised us over the summer that deed restrictions are allowable, they provided updated feedback to us more recently that deed restrictions are not consistent with state law. So the proposed amendments now remove that requirement. Next steps, should the city council approve the first reading today, the proposal would come back for a second reading. Um, 30 days after the second reading, the changes will be in effect, but changes that are part of the local coastal program would not be in effect within the coastal zone until those changes are approved by the Coastal Commission. Also in December, we will be coming back with some additional changes based on a new state law that goes into effect January 1st. And finally, we have um, been working closely with HCD over the summer in developing these changes, um, but the Coastal Commission wants HCD to review our full draft LCP ordinance to ensure conformance with state law before we submit it to Coastal Commission. Um, so any changes resulting from that review will be brought back in December as well. Here's the staff recommendation, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Stanger. Let me see if there are questions, comments by board members first. Excuse me, by council members, excuse me. Mr. Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley, mm -hmm. uh, and thank you uh, for that presentation. I have um, uh, just a couple questions, uh, possibly. Uh, first question towards the uh, lifting of the owner occupancy requirements. So owner occupancy, as you were saying, means that the, either the property owner or a family member, I believe, by our local code has to live on the property uh, if there's an owner occupancy requirement either in the home or with the ADU. Uh, so if that property comes up for sale, the buyer knows that they will have to live on that property either on the, uh, in the home or in the ADU. But if we list that requirement, then that would mean that that would open up that property to buyers who possibly don't want to live on that property. Maybe they just want to rent out 
the home and the ADU. Would, would that be correct? That's correct. So it would be like any other ADU, any other property with an ADU constructed in 2020 or later that the owner can live on the property or they can live somewhere else and rent both the units if they want to. Okay, so it would open up that property to, uh, when it comes up for sale, it would open up that property to people who don't plan to live there or uh, possibly do that, okay. It, yes, if we were to remove the owner occupancy requirement for those properties. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, thank you. The um, Moving to the sale of ADUs, and I notice, I think in the general report it mentioned a little bit, but is there is there any data on how that program has worked in cities similar to Santa Cruz? Um, so the city of San Jose has recently implemented an ordinance. Um, I reached out to them. Um, I didn't get any information about how their how theirs is going. It's very, very new. They've okay. had it in place for a couple of months, so maybe it's too soon for them to really tell. Um, other parts of the country do have for sale ADUs. Um, there's a webinar that I watched by the Casita Coalition that highlighted um, Austin, Texas, and then also Oregon State. Um, I know Portland has a, a program, and um, there, there's a lot of people that do it. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah, that's that's all the information that I that I found on that. Right. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I, I guess my my final question. I'm kind of asking asking this under the assumption that an ADU seems like it'd be a lucrative asset for an investor. I mean, you could. Seems like you could buy a one bedroom ADU for around five hundred thousand dollars, maybe, and turn around and rent it out for three hundred thousand dollars, which would be a lot more lucrative than buying a two bedroom fixer upper in town for one point five million, then putting money into fixing that up, then uh, reselling that out. Um, so, I guess w with that assumption, my question is: Is there anything that could stop somebody from coming in and just purchasing a majority of those units, or outbidding community members for those units, and then turning around and just renting those? units out for market rate, say $3,000 for one bedroom? Uh, the proposed ordinance doesn't have a prohibition on renting of the units. Right. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Bruner. Thank you. you. You kind of touched on one of my questions. Um, I think in, in summary, this um, achieves some good, good goals for our community. Um, it, it certainly helps with the housing diversity we need and lifting the restrictions creates equity with, with this, with the ADUs um, for those that had it before 2020 and those after 2020, just aligning that consistency. Um, and so I think, you know, maybe it's a further um, discussion on how to help support ADU sales and rentals not being a predatory um, thing. And I, I don't, I'm not looking at you for an answer um, other than it raised a question for me um, for any investor who sees a less expensive way to monetize their profit, it could be used in that way. And so I'd be interested in the, you know, future housing um, discussions and certainly embedded within our housing element and how that we can support uh, moving forward with this um, in a way that supports the intent. Thank you. That, that can continue to be an ongoing discussion with our anti-displacement work, certainly. Yes. And, and I do just want to mention, too, that, you know, that concern over someone buying and then renting for more can exist anywhere in the city for any residential unit right now, just not a single-family house with an ADU. And it's only in that circumstance. So that's still that scenario is still possible anywhere, unfortunately. But uh, we're just looking to make it a more fair process across the board and, and allow this additional way to purchase a property. 
Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Um, yeah, so I, I appreciate the, some of the things that I've been thinking about and wondering about have been asked, and I'm getting my sense of what the answer is. Uh, but I want to ask uh, for the benefit primarily of the, the public and those who have tried to understand what these changes might mean, um, does the letter, which was in our agenda packet from HCD, uh, responding to the city's AD ordinance require that we eliminate owner occupancy for ADUs constructed before 2020? That's one question. And two, does that letter uh, require that the city allow for condominium conversion on single family lots due to the new, the second Ting bill? Sure. So state law. Uh, prohibits us from requiring owner occupancy for units created in 2020 and beyond. So there's a new state law, um, I think it was earlier this year, and it um, the, the, pre, the previous state law eliminated that requirement or eliminated our ability to impose a requirement for ADUs created from 2020 to 2025, and then the new law basically ended that sunset date. So it's not necessarily retroactive to the units before 2020. And then with regard to your second question, there is no requirement that we create an ordinance to allow the separate sale of ADUs. That state law creates an option for us to create that ordinance. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that because that was confusing for some people who uh, had read this agenda report and I had questions about it come to me. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Colin Jari Johnson. Thank you for the work on this. I had a couple of clarifying questions. Um, the the piece about the 67% threshold, I think I read one thing in the agenda report and then I thought I heard another thing. Can you just describe that and explain it again? I'm not understanding it. Sure. So there's um, a part of our subdivision ordinance that says um, that as long as the multifamily vacancy rate in Santa Cruz is less than 5%, um, conversions of rental units to condominiums are not allowed. And then there's a set of exceptions to that. And one exception is that if 60% of those units are purchased by the tenants, then that project could be converted to condominiums. So this is removing so, that. So this would remove it for projects where ADUs and a primary dwelling are converted to condominiums and four or fewer condominiums are created. So it would basically affect single family or duplex properties with ADUs. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is around the, um, the rental inspection registration program. So we named the exemptions, exemptions for um, units occupied by family members, newly constructed units less than five years, units where a section eight. Um, so, so those units are exempt from having to pay the cost, but they still have to register for the program. Can you um, explain why they would need to register? What's the thinking behind them registering? If we're not actually gonna do the inspection? That's a great question. Um, Kim Dory um, is in our audience and she can answer that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Kim Dory, I am the co compliance supervisor with the Planning Community Development Department. So we would have them register but not pay the fee um, because sometimes things change over the years. So they would let us know is it still being occupied, say, by an immediate family member, or is it still being inspected by an additional agency? So they have to let us know that it's it remains unchanged. So them registering gives us their contact information and allows us to keep in touch with them. What's the point of registration? Like, at what point do these units register? And who oversees that? How do we know if a unit's going to be registered so the, they should be registering as soon as they rent it. And okay. we send out letters, but um, sometimes we get complaints. 
um, that are on rental properties that we didn't already have in our program. Um, but essentially, all all property owners that are that have rentals are required to register. So if there's an ADU and there's a family member living in it and they're not paying rent, correct? They're not required to register. They would still have to register, but they wouldn't have to pay. But we, as a city, wouldn't necessarily know. Correct. Right now, it all would trigger that for us. So it's voluntary. Correct. Okay. It just seems implementation is a little gray for me, and I'm I'm not. It's it seems like there's um, uh, it's cumbersome to require the registration for these units that are exempt, and then oversight of implementation of them could be really. I don't know how we do that. So, but maybe that's two in the weeds. <laughs> yeah, I can speak to that just a little okay. bit more. Like, like Kim was saying, um, the contact information is important, but ultimately it's, it's voluntary. Yeah. Some of these often just come up with complaints, for instance, mm -hmm. and and then oh, you're not in the registry, and then then you're added at that point. So the real goal here is is again, uh, it's somewhat anti-displacement related as well, mm -hmm. and making sure that. There isn't at some point a code case that makes someone have to leave that housing. Okay. And that's that's one of the goals of that rental inspection service. So yeah, ideally we'd be in touch with everyone, uh, but if that's not the case, we ultimately only usually find complaint out driven. when there's a complaint. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I have comments, but I'll save those. Okay. Councilmember Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let's see, I have a couple of questions and I too have comments, so I'm going to try to save my comments, but frame my questions <laughs> in a way that feel like questions. I think my first one is in regards to the state law for the owner, owner occupancy requirement. Um, why, I guess my wondering is I understand that you're saying at the equity, equity perspective just to lift it all together, but would your read of the state law be intentional to um, tier kind of this broader expansion of housing on the market that is now open to potential investors versus sort of over time changing with new ADUs coming online? I mean, why wouldn't the state law do that? That I guess is what my question is, why should we do something different? Well, I think this, this, I don't know that the state law intentionally wanted to require owner occupancy for units constructed prior to 2020. Um, I think that there was no requirement for that. That's a, something that the city decided to do on its own, and maybe other jurisdictions in California were doing also, and the state decided to remove that going forward. Um, so the, the state law doesn't um, specifically require it one way or another for units constructed prior to 2020. So it's up to us as a city to decide if we want to create separate categories here or continue, we have two separate categories, if we want to continue them or if we want to just make everything consistent with state law at this point. Yeah, the, the state has been seeking to just remove barriers mm -hmm. um, from ADU development and owner occupancy was, was considered one such barrier. Uh, for instance, again, we, we've had someone come to us before they had to leave overseas for work for a few years and had an ADU and they would have to sell their house rather than just rent it for two years and come back, for instance. Mm -hmm. So certainly something that people have to think about when they're purchasing a home or, or building an ADU that the state removed. I think um, there's always trade-offs with these types of policies, right? And I think those situations for sure make a lot of sense. I totally get it. And I think there's potential for this to open up a, an entire new investor market. And I'm wondering if that trade-off has been considered by the staff as well as an unintentional consequence of opening it up completely. Um, well, I, I agree it could open things up to investors just as, you know, and so many other types of units are open to investors. Um, I looked at the numbers of how many ADUs, you know, we, we have a significant number of ADUs that currently have this requirement, but we also have a massive number of ADUs that are being constructed every year under these more relaxed standards. And we're going to end up with, I believe, far more ADUs 
that don't have an owner occupancy requirement that already are open to investors. So I don't know that protecting from investors what may end up just being a handful consider like in comparison to the total number. I don't know if that's, I mean, that's a question for you, but that was kind of my thinking of, you know, that's kind of a policy question if we want to do what's just going to be for basically a small group compared to the whole or to have equity across the board for all the ADU owners. And you have those numbers of how many are existing versus been constructed and then how many were constructed between 2020? Sure. So, so prior to 2020, we had about 550 ADUs total. And then since the start of 2020, it's been, um, I think we're at about 375 now. And based on the rate of how many we're approving, we might get five to 10 more by the end of the year. Okay. Um, and it's, it would average around 75 ADUs per year since 2020. So 375, 75 ADUs per year. So within the next three years, if we continue at this rate, those the numbers constructed after 2020 will overtake the numbers that were constructed right. for like the 35 years before 2020. And then the state law though is now saying since 2025, is that right? So, so then that wouldn't the, necessarily include this, the ones that are constructed currently. It, so it, can, it includes everything after 2020. So the state law everything. first said no owner occupancy required for units constructed from January 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2025. Then, then another state law said we're going to get rid of that 2025 deadline and it's just anything from 2020 onwards can no longer have an owner occupancy requirement. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, what else? I think that might be uh, the other questions have been asked and answered. So I think that that concludes my questions. Thank you. First question, comments by members. Uh, let me make sure I understand that. Do we have the discretion here to uh, essentially require owner occupancy or not? We do for we, we have the discretion to continue require it for those units constructed prior to 2020. But we cannot allow owner occupancy for any unit with a building permit issued from January 1st, 2020 onward. So I think that it seems to me maybe what there is here is a, a bit of a public policy debate around what we think may happen in the future. Uh, and, and I think that maybe is what you're hearing from the council uh, that there is a thought that this creates a certain kind of equity going in the direction that the planning department wants us to go. Uh, I think there's another belief system at play here on the city council right now that says that may be true, but uh, it also may be true that if we require owner occupancy of one of these two, we're more likely to have more affordable units over time. And so I, I think there's a belief system difference going on here that is trying to anticipate future utilization and what those patterns then look like. Um, I think there's also a question here. If, if I understand this right, under our current situation, it, am I right that someone can say, uh, gee, my company is moving me to the Philippines for a year. Uh, can you give me an exemption for a year to allow me to go take that job? I'll come back, and then I'll move back in. And in the meantime, both of those can be rented. Is that essentially right? There's some provision? There is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will you describe, give me a little more detail on that provision? Are there boundaries around that time other issues around that? Um, yes. Um, I I haven't looked into that okay. in recently. Maybe Mr. Butler well. on that? Sure. sure. If, if you could give us just a minute, I can pull those regulations. Um, we have processed one or two of those in the seven years that I have been okay. here. Um, and they do go to the council for the council approval. Um, but Give us uh, just a moment, continue with your glad conversation you, if you don't mind, and glad, we'll, no, we'll pull I'd, that up. I'd like to get the answer, and if that takes a minute, you'll have a minute, no, or, or longer. 
uh, such, or, uh, such as you wish. Uh, well, I'll, what I'd like to do is let me go out to the public at this point while the gentleman is responding. Anyone who's with us today who wishes to comment on item 15, this would be your opportunity to do so. And uh, while Mr. Ewing is approaching, we have folks online. Okay, what we'll do is we'll start with Mr. Ewing, then we're going to toggle back and forth between people online and people in the council chambers. Mr. Ewing, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I really feel like I'm in a time warp. Mm. Just a time warp, you know, I've only really been in construction since 1988. Um, did a primarily in the Palo Alto area, moved in this county in, I think, 94, 95, and was dealing with all kinds of code compliance. Lived in the scenic corridor where you had to have a minimum of 20 acres. Go on for days about lots of issues that were that happened, I helped solve, and couldn't do anything about it. wasn't my money anyway. And now here we have all of this 15-minute uh, city stuff, and I, how in the heck are you going to legally describe the title on an ADU? Three quarters of the value of the property is the land. So this just seems like another micromanagement. And it's, well, lots of business opportunities for me personally, of course, but that's not why I'm here. You know, the state is working to reduce barriers about ADUs. What has the state been doing? to hassle people like that live in this county. Oh my goodness, it is horrific. So I'm curious what the, whatever legal definition one or two have proceeded that Mr. Butler is gonna come up with. I don't know, I took a couple pages of notes on this one. Let me go back to something about this. Um, the separate sales of ADUs, it just seems baffling to me. And once again, wants to stop people from taking a, um, single family home into a R10. You know, what point are people going to be living in, um, I don't know, bike lockers? How many bike lockers could you put on a piece of property? So, I mean, to try to keep some humor with the whole situation, humor is pretty important. So thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. We'll take the first person online. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Yeah, this is Garrett again. Hey, the state was bad enough when it temporarily removed ownership occupancy requirements from new ADU parcels in a misguided temporary attempt to spur a new building, but now allows full remote ownership in perpetuity. The left always moves further left. They also did so to force people into denser rental communities whether they want it or not. You wish to go further, calling it fairness, do you, to allow no owner occupancy requirement for earlier built properties when the owners agreed to such rules and most willingly because they knew it made for a better neighborhood. What you and the state refuse to acknowledge is that when investor class types like BlackRock are allowed to gobble up single family neighborhoods, the American dream dies and improving neighborhoods cease. Rental properties don't show ownership investment pride. Your extreme greed shows here by expanding the rental inspection program to include basically all properties. The reality is the ADU stock is fairly new. It's not exactly slumlord Mediterranean Avenue, and many owners will still reside somewhere on the properties and care about their conditions, but increasingly less so as the American dream system dies at the state's and your hands. Your oppressor victim, Marcus tenant protection brain freeze is a sham. I say you only want the extra money for the city, really both. Thank goodness this King assembly person that uh, from SF has termed out and we won't be seeing any more of his leftist damaged ADU legislation. Recall San Francisco is the worst run city in America. I seem to recall rail inspections started out long ago as voluntary if a landlord would accept section eight vouchers to be, ensure the state got its money's worth the leftist California has progressed, make that progressified, to the government sticking its nose into every aspect of people's lives and charging them for the effort. There is little to no history of the ADU condominium idea, and also as a condominium owner, I can assure you it is second class to owning uh, my SFR property outright. It's more collectivist thought and makes some sense in larger developments, but the ADU as a condominium idea is a bit bizarre and more destruction, I'm sure more shrinkflation density of SFR housing to complete the job of vanquishing SFR. 
Wasn't Lizard Brain Emperor Newsom's lot splitting enough? Desecration of single family housing enough for you? I see this item comes to us from the unelected bureaucrats, which I've come to understand are the unaccountable tools for this most leftist of states. They're not bad people. I almost forgive them when you work for and wish to career advance in the biggest bureaucratic ideological defective monopoly imaginable. No one gets ahead questioning the nonsense, no matter how twisted. They can't exactly quit and work for another government, can they? I only hope uh, owning an oasis property like mine, bounded on all sides without ADUs, I can live in peace until the end of my days. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. My name's Hugh Fowler. I'd like to address the middle of the uh, of 15, require properties with ADU units to enroll in the residential rental inspection service. It seems to me that this is a proposal in search of a problem. You're suggesting that any ADU, if you pass this uh, proposal, will automatically be required to sign up for the rental inspection service. Uh, I heard your estimates of the number of ADUs, and it seems like within the next couple of years, we're going to have 1,000 ADUs in Santa Cruz or more. And this, this uh, 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 proposal would require that every one of those ADUs has to pay money and uh, submit themselves to a, an inspection. And that just seems to me onerous and unnecessary. Um, if we're trying to remove barriers to housing, <clears throat> rental housing and other kinds of housing, why automatically require 1,000 or more ADUs to pay money and sign up for a rental inspection service once a year or maybe every three years. I heard um, the discussion about po some exceptions to the requirement to sign up for the inspection service if the ADU isn't rented or if the ADU is occupied by another family mem member, but I don't have access to all the language that, that uh, pertains to those exceptions. And I'm not, it sounds like Please. you don't have the uh, protocol down yet as to how you administer those exceptions and it just seems to me you're you've automatically said let's require another inspection for all these ADUs and it's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to cost a lot of staff time and I don't see the necessity thank you thank you sir we'll take the next person online good afternoon person online welcome to the city council <laughs> meeting Good afternoon. Three, two, one. Ms. Greenside, Hello. good afternoon. Hello. No, Council, we'll go, can you hear me? We'll Hello? go to you in a minute. Person online, we'll go to you in a minute. Ms. Greenside, be ready to testify, person online. Before I start, could I just request that the timer be visible to the person speaking? Because it's not on the display and this isn't running. And seeing a timer, uh, as a member of the public, is very helpful for... Okay. Thank you. We'll turn it on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I thought you said it was on, and I thought I was dreaming. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to address this issue, so I haven't sort of got my thoughts well organised. Um, ex but I, I see some questions being asked by council that gives me some hope that it's not just a steamroller going forward. I attended all of the uh, council meetings and planning commission meetings years ago when ADUs were first proposed. And at that time, the planning department expressed that they saw that there was, they, there was a need to address almost two competing issues, one, the desire for more housing, and the other, the impact of ADUs on neighbourhoods. And they, they took that very seriously. And the room was full of people, some of whom who were impacted by an ADU. The logic of having a two-storey ADU because you have a two-storey house has always escaped me. That seems like 
uh, not a wise choice. Um, but the, the concerns were real, and now we're in a different era when there seems to be no concern for the impact of the mushrooming of ADUs. I understand the, um, the value of them. I don't believe that they are affordable in a real sense of the word, but they do provide a level of housing. However, the need for owner occupancy was very clear then, and I think that hasn't disappeared even though state laws have changed. We live in a college town. 54% of our housing is owned by someone who doesn't live there. And the impact of having um, ADUs without an owner on site is, I think, arguably quite different than the owner being there and being able to monitor what happens. And to throw that away on the, the sort of, I know state law is there, but that could change. And that's what I thought I heard from Mayor Keeley, that maybe we shouldn't be locking something in that may change. So I would just encourage to, uh, we can't fight state law at this moment and at this time, but we can uh, make a decision not to take action, which down the road we may um, have some regrets. Thank you. Thank you. Person online, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Person online. Hello, council, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? You know, it takes, a, it takes a few seconds between when you say that and when Zoom lets me unmute, just an FYI. Um, first of all, you guys should ask the planning department how backlog the rental inspection program is and what kind of uh, additional load it's gonna place on them because they are backlogged and they don't always do their inspections uh, even in the year that they're supposed to. Um, but what I really wanted to address was the ordinance 23.37.020, which is the um, addresses what Ms. Stanger uh, brought up the conversion of existing structures to condos for multi-residential properties. And um, that 5% vacancy requirement planning has never really tracked that well. Um, and it's very difficult to track. So there, in essence, there's been a prohibition against uh, condo conversions. And I think if you step back and think about it, it's probably more appropriate to allow condo conversions for multi-residential buildings because what you're going to open up owner occupancy opportunities for young families like Ms. Stengler was talking about but also I mean if an investor buys a condo it's still going to be a rental <laughs> so I don't really see the logic in maintaining this effective prohibition against condo conversions for multi-residential structures and allowing it for you know, it is, it just doesn't make sense to me in any way. I mean, why, it doesn't seem like it would meet any goal, housing goal for the city. Also, you should know that um, not all buildings are gonna be able to be converted because they have to meet, older buildings aren't gonna meet the building codes that would allow them. There's all kinds of, you know, fire codes and in newer building codes. So a lot of older you know the you know the 10 unit and less buildings there it's going to be very difficult and expensive to convert them so i don't think you're going to have a huge rush but anyway i'd like you to consider those two points thank you very much thank oh, you this is eric much. Broderick. I, I didn't say my name Th thank you very much good afternoon sir john golder um i'm going to go over something where uh, this uh D denser housing is not consistent with the state law in CEQA. Now, uh, I, I worked in the city uh, planning department in the building inspection for six years. Very familiar with the process. And uh, uh, the housing element and in general plan, this, the city um, claims uh, when they fill out the, uh, the CEQA that there's no um, significant effect. Uh, and because of what they call CEQA tiering, um, it's just a plan, it's, you're not actually building anything, there's no real world effect. So when we get down to specific projects, and of course this kind of work is going to create a lot of specific projects, 
then uh, expect a result as much more density. And so at that level, you've got to make some um, adjustments to, to counteract the, the, um, the density. So the city charges Quimby fees for subdivisions and park fees for non-subdivisions at $3 a square foot. And they park that money in four different quadrants of the city, northeast, northeast, south, southwest, and southeast. Um, and, um, and they claim that, uh, uh, that's, that, that, that $3 a square foot for the, uh, for the, the, the housing, the square footage of the housing is, is covering the, the impact. Well, the bottom line is when, when you look at the way that money is spent, you look at the CIPs, is that 80, 90, 80 to 90% of those CIPs are maintenance work. And the state law regarding the Quimby Act says you can't use that money for to correct existing deficiencies. Um, so millions and millions of dollars have been spent over the years, and they haven't put in new park facilities. That's one of the reasons we haven't built any new ball fields in 60 years, one ball field in 60 years. So um, uh, it's... Um, the, the cost of land now is about two and a half million dollars an acre, which comes down to fifty-seven dollars a square foot. And um, uh, uh, Pogonit, for example, we haven't done a damn thing since the, the park master plan. Ninety-seven cents a square foot, uh, and we can't we can't build anything up there. So um, it, it's. Uh, and, and the city's the park fees haven't been adjusted. They, they said in the park plan that they'd actually been adjusted. They did an annexation study. They did not. That was last done in the early 80s. Um, and uh, uh, they, I've asked the city for nexus studies to, to show that this money is actually related to offsetting the impacts of the, uh, the density of development. They've never provided a single nexus study for that. So there's a lot of things to fix here, and I can add that. I'd love to do a whole work session on that to really explain this stuff and put some printed material in front of you that will show you just how serious the problem is. Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you very much. Person, we have another person online? No? Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello. Carol Paul Hamas, and I just want to say uh, how grateful I am to all of you that you do this. I don't know how you do this, and I'm grateful. Thank you for being here. Mm. Um, I built an ADU. I was an early adopter in 2004 to house my parents, who were both ill and in Florida, to allow me to take better care of them. I want to thank the city staff for all their work in aligning the, the ADU ordinance to current state law, which, with all due respect, I interpret the um, 881 Assembly Bill 881 and 976 very differently in that I believe it does remove all of the owner um, occupancy requirements retrospectively and proactively. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that the city will create a process to make um, uh, curing our deed restrictions as simple and uh, inexpensive as possible. Because I'm part of a large ADA group, I mean, ADU group. Sorry, I'm nervous for some reason. I know a lot of people who have ADUs. Uh, most of them, the overwhelming majority, use them to house their own families. Think college students, uh, kids who are just starting out in the community, older parents, etc. But I have a friend who during COVID turned her ADU into a workout studio for her family, and it, it still remains that. I got a chance to go to Open Studio this last weekend, which I love, and I got to see two ADUs that were art studios. Um, I have another friend who uses an ADU as an office, and another friend who uses one as a small family daycare situation. So not everybody uses their ADU as a rental. I know you don't want to hear that, but it's true. Um, as I read the proposed ordinance, I was surprised to see that the city wants to require all ADUs to register for the Residential Rental Inspection Program, even though ADUs not being used for rentals are specifically exempt from the program. I'm asking you to please remove this requirement. It serves no useful purpose, creates work for city staff, and actually presents a higher level standard than any of the other residential homes that we have, no, nobody's requiring people who live in their home to submit to the 
residential in rental inspection program on the chance that they may move to Chicago and rent their house out. So I think it creates a separate situation for ADUs than for regular residential property, and I'm asking that you consider removing it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Further comment from the public? Ms. Bush, anybody else online? Anyone who's with us? Matters back before the body, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. I, I think I have a motion, but I have a question. Please proceed. Um, what would it look like to do a phased approach of removing owner occupancy? Because I hear what my colleagues are saying about investors flooding and taking over, but I also know that those 550 ADUs, as Ms. Bohemus just um, commented, um, right now we're treating them unfairly. And I've heard from a number of constituents um, over the last three, four years um, saying as much. So what would that look like? Is that a feasible approach? Is my question making sense? Like, um, the phase one is, I'm just throwing this out, phase one is removal of owner occupancy for those ADUs built in from 2010 to 2020. X amount of time later, phase two is removal of owner occupancy from, for ADUs built from 2000 to 2010. You all look really confused. <laughs> Mr. Butler. Thanks for that. Councilmember Calentari Johnson, you could put in something along those lines. It's the it's the council's prerogative for pre-2020. Okay. I, I guess I guess what I'm getting at is is could that address the the, the concern about the flooding of investors um, for the 550 ADUs that would no longer um, require owner occupancy. That's kind of what I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to the concern that I'm hearing from my colleagues. I, I don't know that it would, but that's where I'm going with that. It would, it would certainly um, have a reduced number of units and properties that um, have that owner occupancy um, removal um, applicable to them. So you would still have a subset, you know, let's say half. If you went, if you went that 10 year time frame, I, I'd guess it would, it's roughly half, okay. probably less. It's 35 years, but I think there's probably more between 2010 and so, yeah, between 2010 and 2020. You, you could do it five years, you could do it 10 years, you could do it the, all of them. That's the, it's the council's prerogative. We know, like, um, so we have 550 um, units of ADU. Do we know kind of what time frame they all came in? We would like have to, round. we would have, not right now, we would have to look up that okay. information. I don't have that information at hand, do you? Um, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but generally speaking, the closer we get to the present, the more we're constructed. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Like, yeah, I, I, th I think right. I have a okay. uh, so let's, uh, motion, but I don't know about this piece. So, as you know, what I usually like to do, we asked our questions and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, when we bring it back to the body, I would prefer that we the motion, motion okay. on the table and we debate that, and then we can amend it and do whatever okay. we want to do. But I'll throw out a motion. motion. Go ahead and make I'll it. throw out a motion to um, uh, accept staff recommendation and um, remove the rental inspection registration and consider a phased approach to the removal of the um, owner occupancy. And we can get into okay, the details of what that is. Is there a second? Motion, second. No second on that. All right. Matter is still before the body. Are you ready for a motion or do you have a question? I have a clarifying question and then I have a motion. Okay. I can do the motion. Why well, you can do, uh, let's try to get motions here. Okay. Okay. And then I might want to adjust sure. the motion based Understood. on Sure. Understood. Um, so my motion is to strike the proposed ordinance changes that remove the owner occupancy requirements for ADUs constructed before 2020, and then to direct staff to return to council in two years with a report detailing the regional and statewide landscape and data related to ADU condo com conversions, given it's so new. That's my narrative. Um, and removal of rental requirement if not used for a rental. Rental inspection Remember, requirement? Me, rental inspection requirement. Okay. And otherwise adopt the remaining recommendations? Just, I want to make sure I'm clear. 
No, no, let, get, you got to speak at the sure. microphone. Or... Sorry. Um, so I just want to be clear. You're, you're saying remove the um, owner occupancy, uh, it, remove the removal of owner occupancy prior to 2020. Just, just because and, it's a and then um, what the and I didn't I, I wasn't clear on the condo conversion so element the, the, to remove the sale that too and to, just remove, okay. to have the staff come back in two years with a summary of how it's worked in other jurisdictions. I want to be sure, Ms. Bush, sure, we're going to slow this it? way down. <laughs> slow this way down. Yeah. So I'm a, I can reread the motion. Yeah, and I thought what you were doing is adopting the staff recommendation with the following amendments or changes, is that it? And then you have one on owner occupancy, you've got one on owner on rental inspections. Is I wanna know how you wanna do I, this. I can do that, but I think it deviates pretty significantly from staff recommendations, so okay. I don't know if it's a All different right. Let's, approach. yes, Ms. Bush. I just want to clarify, um, when you say staff recommendation, are you talking about what's in the agenda report or are you talking about the presentation slide because they were different? Oh. Um, um, there are two ordinances that are in front right. of you for mm -hmm. approval. So mm -hmm. are you striking both those things from both those ordinances? For the first, for the ADU ordinance, my understanding is that it would, well, okay, I guess it would be to adopt the changes within the ADU ordinance to be consistent with state law. They're both ADU ordinances. The first one with the ADU um, constructed before 2020. Just not accepted in, I mean, what's easiest in terms of process, I guess would be the question. Because I think I've deviated quite a lot from what is being recommended from staff versus if, I think for record keeping, it would be easier if you take the staff recommendation that is in the agenda report and say, Introduced for publication ordinance, um, okay, whatever, with the following amendments. Okay. If I could echo that, Councilmember Watkins, uh, into the mayor's point, um, accept accepting staff recommendations with the following, with the following amendments okay. or changes. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Yeah. I, my clarification though is that what staff recommendation was, because the PowerPoint slide was different than what was ahead of you in the agenda report. So let's, let's uh, I want to make sure as the presiding officer I've got this correctly here. So you have two ordinances submitted for our first reading, correct? And that is the recommendations. Am I correct on that so far? Mr. Van Waal, anybody? Correct. I, I believe the the recommendation that was in our PowerPoint was just an abbreviated version of, of what's in the staff report. Good. So, so the staff report is the correct to, recommendation. Good. Okay. So I'm we're going to eliminate any reference to the staff report today. So we're going to the staff recommendation here on page 15.1 in our agenda packet. The first one is to acknowledge this environmental determination about one ordinance, and there's another one. The same thing, and then directing the city manager to submit an LCP amendment to the Coastal Commission, right? That's your recommendations. So if we want to amend any of that, we go to amendments of the ordinance, correct? That's what we would do. Okay. Thank you. So now let's direct members' attention to starting on page 15.12 at Sequitur, you have that actual first ordinance. Then there, we okay so far? Mm -hmm. So on the ordinance that begins on page 15.12, we want to, your desire is to mend it as follows, and, and you can state those and then we'll get staff to put it in the right place. Let's get the concept that you want to amend first. The concept is to really just strike any of the additional proposals from staff to have owner occupancy required re requirements for ADUs constructed for before 2020 to be lifted to essentially comply with state law. So could I characterize that as retain ownership, uh, owner occupancy requirements for 
ADUs constructed prior to January 1st, 2020. Sure. There we go. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. So far, so good. Okay. Ms. Bush, tracking that so far? Okay. okay. Other amendments you would like to offer? I don't know how, okay, so in this, so for this ordinance then, let me see. For the rental inspection component, is that in the first ordinance to require the registration for rental inspection? It's in the non-LCP ordinance. Say it again. It's in the non-LCP ordinance. Okay. So in that item, in that ordinance. The, the non-LCP ordinance is the first ordinance. The second ordinance is the LCP ordinance. Just to, sorry to jump in, but just to be clear. There's a lot of points. Okay, then in that ordinance also to strike, um, to remove or to, to remove the rental inspection requirement if, if the rental of the ADU is not used for occupancy. I don't I, I think mean, I that's don't, what you're... I mean, it's for... for what are you trying you're not to do? It for, for, yeah. for somebody else. If you're just using it for your own open studio. I don't know how you say that in ordinance Well, if language. it's not rented. If Isn't you're not that renting your it. issue? Hmm? Your issue is if the ADU is not rented out. That's a different way of saying it. If it's not rented. Is that your issue? Yeah. Okay. So you would eliminate the rental inspection requirement unless somebody is renting. In other words, that, if, if I understand your, your memo, what we're trying to get to is there's a little bit of a whiff of the empty home tax here, which is trying to capture, whether intentionally or not, trying to capture everybody right. and then whether you're renting or not, and then you would have this obligation to check in with the city and say, okay, now I am renting and come out and do a rental inspection. That's the way it currently would work if we adopt this, correct? You have an ADU, you have to, re you have to register, whether you're renting or not. And then if you rent, you would have to say, city, come out and inspect because I'm going to rent this unit. If you don't do that, you never have to call them. But you do have to register whether or not you ever intend to rent, correct? Okay, I think the gentlelady Correct. is trying to eliminate that requirement. Correct. Okay. And then the last, okay, so let me just make sure I'm on the right ordinance here then, excuse me. It's for both. It's for both, okay. For the, for the last section, which is to basically not, so direct staff to return to council in two years with a report detailing the regional and statewide landscape and data related to ADU condo con conversions. So that's just stri striking it completely. We should not proceed moving forward with that recommendation I don't, and to come back after we learn from other communities. You tracking this, Mr. Butler, we, we get Mr. Van Wa, Ms. Stanger, are you track, we're good. Now let me check with Ms. Bush, make sure we're, we're tracking all the way. We're good. Sorry. This okay. Is confusing for me. Okay. Is that your motion? That's my motion. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Newsom. Uh, you can open on your motion. Okay. Um, I, I had one clarifying question, but I will, I'll just put a little narrative to it. I think, you know, for me being part of the council for all these years, I think there's just been a lot really quickly, frankly, in terms of the housing. And I know when people were really sharing their hopes with ADUs and using ADUs, it's really about compliance with neighborhood, again, to have density in the downtown, to preserve neighborhood feel, right? And I, so I also know that it's a small unit that is encouraged for construction. And so there is this movement around having more ADUs coming online. And I, I totally understand that too. I think for, our community, it's just the unintended consequences of this, not knowing enough about it, and given the fact that we're completely, you know, a very unaffordable community, I have concerns about just lifting it completely. Um, I think that could change. Certainly, state law could come in and change it, or a future council can change it, but for me, it was uh, a way to kind of have a little bit of control over that, and so I feel more comfortable with that at this point. Um, I do have a clarifying question I want to get to at, at some point, but I, I'll wait till after I finish my opening remarks. Well, I'm not sure. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, <laughs> I'll clarify, do my question. My thanks for all of us. So no, that's ahead. fine. Please In terms ahead. of like, you know, the exceptions, 
we had an exception come forward when the man who was working overseas came and he shared his experience and we could waive that exception. And I don't know if there's an opportunity for kind of getting at what Councilmember Kalantari Johnson was trying to get to, which is like to waive, you know, this requirement or some sort of an exception clause that would allow for those types of circumstances. You mentioned the person who's trying to, you know, leave into a, a, a nursing facility and has, you know, special circumstances. I don't know. But, like, I wonder if there's a way to build in some exceptions for special circumstances, I guess, is the question. Thanks for that question, <clears throat> Councilmember Watkins. Um, before um, the public comment, there was a question about what is built into our code. We do have that section. It's 24.16.140, and um, it basically says, I'll, I'll paraphrase it first and then quote, um, you have to be an owner or the immediate family of the owner to, quote, um, you must occupy either the primary or accessory dwelling as his or her principal place of residence except under circumstances as established by resolution by the city council that may allow the property owner or the executor or trustee of the property owner's estate to apply to the city council for approval of a temporary change in use allowing both units to be rented for a period of no more than two years with a possible extension of one year. Um, so yeah. um, there's there's more to both, but that's that's the uh, the crux of it. So you can do it for two years um, with council approval is, um, <clears throat> and you'll recall there was that yeah, there one, was this issue. Yeah. Um, and um, then uh, that can be extended for one more year. That's the current regulations. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm comfortable with that exception, and you know, being used if needed, and if if they wanted to change it, it could be changed at a future time. But I feel good with that. Um, and then in regards to the other kind of proposal for um, the sale, I, I fully hear your story and circumstance. I don't think there's a lot of opportunity to have new housing for sale, and I think this is really new. And I know that San Jose is one of the first ones who've really moved forward with this kind of a, approach, and I think it's good to learn from jurisdictions that are doing that, but to figure out what could work for Santa Cruz, and, and frankly, I'm just not comfortable at, the, at this point. So that's that's my rationale behind not uh, supporting that aspect as well. Thank Further you. under discussion, Ms. Contour Johnson. Oh, she want to go as a second. Pardon me? Does he want to go as a seconder? Either sure. way, it's up to you, Mayor. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I am not comfortable with this motion. I think it essentially rejects what staff was trying to do here. Um, so it would have, I think, been more simple to, to say reject staff recommendation. Um, you know, I, I just, I strongly believe that we can't say that we wanna be an inclusive community and not pursue these types of bold policies. Um, this is the direction that we agreed on as a council in our housing element um, to explore. Um, so I guess we're exploring it. And um, I do think it's unfair that those 550 units that um, were built before 2020 are now not given the same um, opportunity as those who were built after 2020. Um, I've heard from a number of constituents over the years, as I mentioned before, and they just don't understand why are they held to different standards and different laws than other community members, just because they were on the cutting edge and they were on the forefront and they were trying to help us um, increase our housing units in our community. Now they're being sort of quote unquote punished for it. So I think it's not fair to um, require a different set of requirements for these individuals. I was trying to get to the concern around the flooding of investors through that phased approach, because I, I hear that concern, and I think that is a real concern. Um, but we didn't land there. Um, I have also heard from a lot of community members, we've discussed this as a council, that we want more pathways to home ownership. Again, we call this out in our housing element. I think this provides a real pathway to home ownership. We just had a community member um, publish an op-ed in one of our papers about the, you know, how difficult it is, this person is a real estate agent, how difficult it is for them and their family to find home ownership. So I think this ordinance was attempting to do both of those. Um, there would probably be bumps in the road. Um, we've been on the forefront of housing policy, and I think this did that. So as it stands, I won't be supporting the motion. Thank you. Councilmember Newsom, then Ms. Brown, then Ms. Bruner. Councilmember Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And can I ask a, a quick question just to Councilmember uh, Watkins? Yes. Just, to, uh, just to make sure. So the motion and uh, 
the motion basically is just a way of not accepting the staff recommendation and then directing staff to come back in two years with data on the separate sale of ADUs, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Um, so I just want to start by uh, just thanking staff for bringing this forward, and I, I appreciate the intent for these recommendations and especially to find ways to bring about more cheap entries into home ownership in our community, which is something I support uh, uh, looking into. Uh, but I also think, um, I also think these ordinances could have several unintended consequences. I think um, lifting the owner, owner occupancy um, requirement could increase competition for a part of our housing stock, 550 units, which increasing competition increases demand for that housing, which increases the price of that housing, which will eventually lead to higher home prices in our community uh, for that part of our housing stock. Uh, and I also think the separate sale of ADUs is you know, it's a very brand new uh, idea. We don't know how that will work out. Uh, but I do think those ADUs would provide very um, lucrative enticements to investments to investors to come in. You could buy one of those ADUs for much cheaper than you could probably buy an existing home at the moment or existing uh, two-bedroom home, and you could turn around and rent it out for market, uh, for market rate. Uh, so I'm not sure that... While I, I appreciate the intent, I'm not sure that the idea itself would actually lead to more home ownership. If anything, it could possibly lead to more rentals and more expensive rentals as well. Um, so um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the intent, and, uh, but I, I can see just several unintended consequences that we're not sure could come about, could lead to more corporate landlord ownership in our community, could lead to more remote ownership, could lead to a lot of negative consequences that we don't know. So um, at this moment, I'm not prepared to uh, uh, support it, but if in two years it comes back and data from cities similar to Santa Cruz shows something different, then I'd be willing to reconsider that. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you for the discussion. Um, I you know, there was an original motion made that I essentially supported. However, I had questions about that phased approach. Um, as the current motion stands, I will not be supporting it. I think that this intent of the staff recommendation in our agenda packet really gets at creating housing diversity and allowing for flexibility and equity in our housing stock. And I, I appreciate the effort um, that staff put into bringing this forward um, and aligning, uh, you know, the ADUs and compliance with state laws pre and post and, um, you know, eliminating the uh, rental inspection program was brought up. I'm still not clear on that, um, but I would have been happy to support um, eliminating that for now. Um, and so um, I do support the staff um, recommended motion. I think it really aligns with our housing element and it really aligns with um, our intention of creating more home ownership opportunities that we desperately need. Thank you, Council, Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I am going to try to restrict myself to just making a few statements, which can be uh, could easily be disputed. There, uh, you know, we're as the mayor said, uh, making decisions, formulating our, our views and in, in making these decisions based upon what we expect to happen. Those are empirical questions that can't be answered until we have the evidence. Um, and since we don't have evidence with respect to the condo conversion, uh, I agree that we should take some time there before uh, revisiting this or a future council revisiting it. Um, but what I see here overall, uh, removing owner occupancy requirements uh, where we still have some discretion uh, will simply increase, it, in my view, and I'll meet you here in 10 years or so, and we can talk about that <laughs> once we see what's happened. Um, 
just increases the price of housing. It allows small, large, you know, investors to buy up our housing stock. And, um, and I think that the attention to uh, imposing this rental inspection requirement on ADUs is a reflection of that expectation, right? So um, that's why it's there, because our planning department fully expects investors to move in and purchase this, these properties and for them to be rented. So um, I don't see a whole lot of home ownership opportunity embedded in this policy, given the state of our real estate market. Uh, same with uh, the potential uh, owner, you know, condo conversion to purchase uh, smaller uh, buildings on a parcel, um, in addition to the like, you know, very ch the challenges of of trying to do that. Um, again, it's just an incentive for market activity, which is going to drive those prices up. And um, you know, who's to say that investors won't outbid people who are just trying to buy a home because they, based on the expectation that they're going to get a higher rate of return when they can, you know, they can do more on those properties. So. I think that we have a responsibility to try to mitigate against the inflationary pressures on our housing market. Um, and in this case, the trade-off between the limited number of units that could be, uh, that, you know, we might net uh, is, is just not worth the inflationary pressures of uh, these policies in terms of stimulating investor interest. So, um, and, you know, our own real estate you know, analysts who write for the Sentinel have said the same thing. Jeffrey Scharf said the same thing. You know, it's a question. If we can't, if the production doesn't, you know, in, increase at a p faster pace than the market demand, which it never will in this community, then it's going to be an inflationary pressure. It's going to benefit uh, people who have the money to buy up these properties um, and rent them at higher prices. So uh, I fully support this. And I also want to say this has come to us. Um, I often don't say it's Groundhog Day at the city of Santa Cruz, but this has come to us now multiple times. And it has been rejected by the council, um, various councils. Uh, so I think that there ought to be more of a conversation about prior to the staff spending a whole bunch of time on these things uh, to get a general sense of where council members are at, um, because I know you put a lot of work into this, and I appreciate that, and I, too, appreciate the intent. Um, but here we are, and my, my count suggests that perhaps we're going to have to think about something else and revisit this another day. Thanks. For the debate or discussion, seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Do we have a second? Um, okay, thank you. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? No. Alantari Johnson? No. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item number 16. And this is the item uh, Santa Cruz County Civil Grand Jury Response. This matter was before us on a previous occasion. There was an indication that perhaps some more work would need to be done uh, on these responses. The City Council established a uh, City Council uh, working group, uh, Council Member Brown and Bruner and myself. Uh, we met on a couple of occasions, went over the responses, and uh, in light of the uh, public comments and others that we received, there are docu revised documents in your packet today. Uh, and uh, uh, I would uh, entertain any uh, questions or comments uh, that council members wish to have on the preparation of this document. Any questions or comments? I'll, Ms. Brown. I'll make a quick comment. Yes. Um, but first, I want to thank the, my colleagues for allowing for this additional time. I want to thank uh, the city staff who participated in the conversation about uh, the clarity uh, in the responses. 
And I do have some comments, um, but I, th I think I'll hold off on uh, before we um, come back around with the mo or after the motion is made, um, because I want to just to say thank you. Sure. Changes were made, uh, and um, and I do have some thoughts on those, but um, just leave it there for now. Thanks. The opening comments, people wish to make. No, we're good. Okay. Anyone with us wish to make a comment on this? Uh, report in terms of our responses to the civil grand jury. Ms. Greenside, good afternoon. I'm going to ask you a quick question because people have asked me this question. You were a member of the grand jury that prepared this report. As I understand it, your term as a grand juror has now expired. You are testifying as a private citizen. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, Mayor Keeley and Council, Gillian Greenside, speaking as a member of the public and not as a past grand juror. I was taken aback by your response to the two grand jury reports. You took an extra month, I thought, to consider and craft your own response distinct from the staff response. Management staff's defensiveness is perhaps understandable. However, you are elected to represent the people of Santa Cruz. Your response should assess whether the grand jury recommendations are in the public interest, not in the interests of department heads. You would consider the impact on staff, but in the document you took a month to revise, you just parrot the staff response with the same wording, same disinformation and same errors. Inclusionary housing for whom is one of the two grand jury reports requiring your response. Under city code, inclusionary housing is required to give preference or priority to residents and local workers. If the community were asked, do you agree with the grand jury recommendation that the city should be tracking this issue, gathering data and independently ensuring that this code requirement is being followed, or should the city leave that up to the developers and property managers and trust that their signed agreement means the code is being followed, I think the community would agree with the grand jury and not with you. The other grand jury report is preventing rape and domestic violence. Where is the priority? Until 2016, data and metrics on rape, rape showed that the city of Santa Cruz had a far higher incidence of reported rapes by strangers than state and, in, and, sorry, state and national norms. Those metrics have not been gathered since 2016. Whether we still have a high incidence of stranger rape is unknown. If the community were asked, should the Santa Cruz Police Department reinstate community alerts for incidents of stranger rape, with case-by-case -case updates, I think the community would agree with that grand jury recommendation. You claim Santa Cruz PD never stopped issuing alerts. I checked the crime list on the Santa Cruz PD Facebook page. No rapes, stranger or non-stranger listed for 2024, one for 23, none for 22, and none for 21. Your response as it stands is a disservice to the community. It is a neglect of your legal duty to ensure that preventing rape and domestic violence is one of the city's highest priorities. The grand jury recommendation were crafted to help you better fulfill your duty. Your response to the grand jury, regrettably, conjures up images of the mayor of Jaws. Thank you. Anyone else with to make comment on this item. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online with their hand? Up? We do not. Matter is back before the body. Pleasure of the body. I'll move the recommendation. Motion. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Newsom under discussion. Uh, you may open on your motion or Ms. Brown may. No, <laughs> I guess you don't have much. No, I don't, I don't, I know. Please, I, I'll defer to, to Councilmember Brown. I know she did some work on these. Certainly. So I, I don't have, uh, well, I have a lot to say, but I'm just not gonna do it here. Um, the, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be opposing 
the uh, approval of these responses. I, it, that is not to say I don't appreciate the work that went into uh, trying to better respond. Um, I think in the case of the, um, and I want to thank Bonnie Lipscomb for really working to, to get that data uh, on the level of affordability and to commit to having a tracking system that is available to the public because I do think that is um, an important piece for transparency about like what categories of low income um, are, you know, are, are the are inclusionary units falling within. Um, I continue to have concerns about the accuracy of, you know, the monitoring and enforcement of who's living in those units based on just anecdotal evidence I am aware of. Um, but my concern is really particularly with the uh, rape data reporting. And it became clear in the conversation that um, we just have very different perspectives on, um, um, on what accountability to the com community means in this regard because, um, you know, one can't dispute that the uh, the city is is not doing anything that it's it's um, let's see how to say this <laughs> politely um, the the city you know this whether or not the city is going to provide this information is a policy question um, and it's a legal question and um, the report making findings and recommendations that the city disagrees with um, you know that. That's a, that is one thing. The way it is written is what really bothers me because I wish that the report just said, we just disagree with you and we don't have to do it and we're not going to do it because that would be more honest. Um, so I'm, I'm not in a position to support the response on that one in particular. Um, and you know, I'm going to leave it there because I just, I don't think that there's, um, you know, much, there's not much more to do here. Um, but I will uh, remind everyone who's listening and all of us that, uh, you know, these grand jury reports, as the mayor said, over the years have been uneven um, and they have, the responses have been uneven um, and they do not uh, lead to any accountability unless the community uses that information and those, and the tools that community has to try to make those, these bodies more accountable. Um, so here we are, and we'll see if people um, want to have more of a conversation with our city about this question related to rape data reporting, how it's uh, made available, and um, under what circumstances. Further debate or discussion? Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, I'm actually a little surprised. Um, we, as a subcommittee, met and had a very good discussion and um, implementing some of the going through, uh, you know, point by point and really looking at data. And um, so I just want to say that in, you know, the two reports I think that are most in question here and the responses, the um, uh, rape data, and just for the community to understand that some of the metrics have changed over time and um, the data is there and the commission can receive the data and there is, um, you know, I think it was since August of this year, um, the commission started receiving data from the, um, the uh, I forget the acronym, the uh, NIM NIMBRS, um, and if someone could tell me what that stands for. Um, it's a national database, if I uh, understand correctly. And so I think it was important, um, you know, that was an example of one of the points that we incorporated into the response. And um, it absolutely is a priority um, and absolutely is a priority in getting education and community information and informing the community. Um, 
and also having the resources and available um, services to victims of rape and domestic violence. Um, so I hope that was, um, I feel it was reflected and representative um, in this response. And um, in terms of the housing for whom, um, you know, really getting at the different uh, funding streams and um, requirements in different housing projects and eligibility requirements differ and vary, I think, you know, in identifying what the data that the city can is, um, has been added and in, in really getting a breakdown added to the, the city website to get more clarity for the community um, was also added. And I think um, all of that will be helpful and, and I appreciate all the input and feedback and um, um, thank you. Thank you for the questions, comments. Ms. Brown. I uh, would, I'd like to ask if we could potentially divide the Again. question here uh, so that the um, response to the preventing rape and domestic violence uh, report is separated. Any question which can be divided shall be divided upon a request and a second by a member. Do you, do you request that division? I'm making that request. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Motion a second. Ms. Bush, we will take these up separately. The first motion is to approve the city council response or directing the mayor to provide those responses, honoring commitments to the public. We will start with that one. Debate or discussion? Seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. <laughs> Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Housing for whom? There is a uh, motion. Motion on that? It's, well, the motion's been You're made. Moving Same all motion. Three. Yeah. moving all three. Yeah. Uh, so we'll take up a vote on housing for whom. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Valentary Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. We will take a vote on the response preventing rape and domestic violence. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Valentary Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. I believe we are at the end of our agenda, correct? That's correct. End of the agenda. Any further business, Ms. Bush? Seeing, hearing none. Sadly, our regular vice it? mayor is not here. I'll, but I'll our take that role. <laughs> vice <laughs> Mayor <laughs> Pro Tem with there great reluctance moves. Adjourned. Adjournment. Mr. Newsom seconds. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries in order. We stand adjourned. Thank you for the reminder on dividing the vote. Yeah.